Hey, it's me again, Amy. Last time we spoke, I had made a huge discovery. But before we get to that, let me just remind you how we got here. My father's death left me completely devastated. So mom suddenly convinced me to travel to take my mind off of it. But instead of having a good time, I accidentally got stranded on this exotic island that's owned by a native tribe who do not like foreigners. Luckily, I met Silas, who helped me survive here, and we actually have gotten pretty close. <laughs> We're having so much fun that for a second I forgot that I had to go back, until I heard the rumor that my accident could have been staged. Would my own mother really have caused me to end up here? I needed to go home immediately to find out, and Silas was willing to help with all his might, but it's been a few days, and I haven't heard anything back from him. I waited eagerly, then impatiently for him to come. Finally, one afternoon, I heard a noise outside. I quickly went down to check. To my surprise, it wasn't Silas. It was Nora, and as usual, she looked annoyed to see me. I tried to tell her Silas wasn't here, but she pushed past me anyway and grabbed a stick to draw something. What are you doing? Abstract art? There. Island. I see. People. Then I got it. There is an island? With people? Can we get there? Yes. Can. Go. We can take a boat there? She nodded again and signaled me to follow her. Oh my god! I jumped with excitement! Maybe I was wrong about her. Nora led me to the shore, where she uncovered a small boat hidden behind a bush. Go away! Now! Go! Go! Nora pulled me towards the boat, sat me down, and started pushing the boat towards the water. Isn't it a little late to sail now? Wind! Wind faster! As we reached the edge of the tide, I realized, Wait, I need to tell Silas I'm leaving! Nora immediately became frustrated. Silas! With Dad! Danger! I didn't quite believe her, but I also didn't know if I'd get another chance like this. I couldn't imagine leaving Silas behind without a goodbye. I felt a pit in my stomach, but we will meet again someday. Definitely. Our family has all the money to rescue him later. Just hang on a bit more, hun. I'll go get help. Nora kept pushing me, and she's right. The patrol could detect me at any moment, so I started paddling away. See you again, Silas. But I only managed to go for a few feet, and then it's like my boat got stuck on something. I turned around to see... Silas? What do you think you're doing? Hey! Nora said that there is an inhabited island nearby, and I didn't want to miss the chance. Get off the boat! It's too dark and too dangerous to go out there by yourself. I'll go and check it out first and come back by morning to let you know if it's safe. Stay here! I was confident in his sailing ability, but it seemed Nora wasn't. She ran to cling to his arm, begging him not to go. Still, he ignored her and got on the boat. Nora glared at me before storming off, but I stayed on the shore for a moment, watching Silas disappear into the dark sea. Soon enough, the winds grew stronger and the rain started coming down hard. The storm lasted through the night. I stayed up, waiting in the cave where I spent my first night on the island. The rain stopped by dawn. I couldn't sit still and kept marching back and forth along the shore looking for any signs of Silas. Nora returned soon after, yelling at me in her native tongue. I didn't understand anything she was saying, but I knew she was just as worried for Silas as I was. He'll be back soon, safe and sound. I trust him. And moments later, there he really was, coming back to shore. I couldn't help but run up and hug him as soon as he stepped out of the boat. I asked if he was okay and how he dealt with the rain, and Silas answered all of my questions with a tight hug. But soon we were interrupted by Nora. She shouted angrily and then stormed off. Silas chased after her and said some things that seemed to calm her down. That island is actually your family's gem mine. I've let them know that their boss lady is alive and well and ready to go home. Oh my god, really? They have their ship ready just a bit further offshore since it's dangerous to get close to the island, you know. Just sail out a little bit and they'll pick you right up. Yay! I'm finally leaving! We're finally... Silas stopped walking and looked at me sadly. Come on, let's go! I can't go with you. Nora will only let you go peacefully if I stay here. If I try to leave with you, she'll tell her father. My heart sank. We'll see each other again, I promise. How? Where there's a will, there's a way. Silas squeezed my hand and then let me go. I tried not to look back at him as I got onto the boat and set sail. I traveled for what could have been a few minutes, or a few hours. I couldn't tell anymore, until I was finally spotted by a larger vessel. They set out a lifeboat for me, and once on board, I was well taken care of by everyone. Offered food and warm clothes. But first thing first, I had to contact my family. I called home, and the person on the other end was my grandmother. She's as surprised to hear my voice as me hearing hers. Turns out, after all the shenanigans that happened after my father's death, my grandma had moved into our house to take care of things and wait for my return. We cried for a good ten minutes, and then I told her not to worry. I was safe, and that I'd be home soon. 
When I got home, Grandma, Nanny Emma, and my sister Briona rushed to greet me. As my sister hugged me tightly, I realized how much I had truly missed them, and also realized that my mom was really nowhere to be seen. No one made any mention of her in any way. I worked up the nerve to ask my grandma about her. Right when the police said there were signs of foul play in your disappearance, I already got suspicious. Then when Emma said it was your mother who suggested you go there and play those silly games, I immediately kicked her out. People are truly full of surprises. Do you really think Mom was masterminding all this? She was really trying to get both of you. Briona was lucky she forgot her passport. Don't be glum, dear. You still have me, and Briona and Emma, too. We all love you and care about you very much. Now, go have some rest. It must have been a long journey for you. The next day, as soon as I got up, I went looking for my sister to confirm the things Grandma had said. When I found her, I couldn't stop the tears from spilling out. How could Mom have been the one to do this? Why would she do something like this to her own children? Amy, never listen to a story from one side only. Huh? Do you know something I don't know? Just don't jump into conclusions yet. She then excused herself to work and hurriedly left before I could ask anything else. I kept thinking about what Briona said, but couldn't come up with any other speculation. As I passed my parents' room, I noticed a box sitting outside the door. It's full of my mother's belongings. Nanny Emma is probably packing my mom's stuff out of here. Something in the box caught my eye. I opened it up and found that it was a photo album of me since I was a kid. And next to each picture is some love notes. This is definitely my mom's handwriting. My eyes landed on a photo of myself playing the piano. And my mother wrote, Sweet Pea playing my favorite song. She meant so well, but I was always the ungrateful, rebellious one. Was that why she stopped loving me? Did I do anything that terrible for her to want me gone? I suddenly missed her. I found myself taking the photo up to the piano room, some place I've never gone voluntarily. But as I reached for the doorknob, I heard voices coming from the inside. I peeked through the ajar door. Stop it. It's lucky enough that you didn't get caught. Just get out of here before it's too late. And throw all of my effort in vain? No way! My plan was going so well. How on earth could she survive? So, plan B. You need to secure that spot in the board of directors before Amy gets in the way, and I'll take care of the rest. But, oh god, them? They were behind all this? That night... I waited until I had everyone together to make an exciting announcement. Tomorrow, I'm officially going to start working for the company. I've been working on a proposal to pitch to the board of directors to gain their approval. That's wonderful, dear. Don't you think you need some sort of rest, sweetheart? You went through a big ordeal and... I'm ready. I'm totally fine. Well, Briona will also be returning to the company, and I'm glad I'll be able to help her out. The more hands, the better. I'm so glad you want to join the company. Later that evening, Nanny came into my room with a warm glass of milk. Oh, Emma, you always take such good care of me. Well, tomorrow's going to be a big day, and you need to get a good night's rest. Thank you. Finish your milk before it gets cold, sweetie. Good night. I hugged the warm milk glass and smiled at her as she walked out. Okay, one last revision and then I'll go prepare my outfit for tomorrow. But my eyes, so tired. Suddenly, I was woken up by a sound at the door. Then it slowly opened, followed by footsteps. Someone is walking towards me. She's looking for my documents. Aha! Time to wrap up your play, Emma. Oh, sweetie, go to sleep properly in bed. I'll, I'll help you tidy up. Cut the act, you witch. What do you think you're going to find here? My presentation for tomorrow? Joke's on you. It's a trap. But the milk, you've drank it all. You mean the glass of milk-flavored hypnotic? I've poured it down the drain. Sorry. Suddenly felt lactose intolerant. Bold of you to think you can fool me in my own house. I've seen everything. But why do you want to take me down that bad? Emma, aren't we? Because my daughter, Briona, deserves this company more than you. Before I could even process that information, Emma was rushing towards me holding a chloroform-soaked rag. Just as she backed me into a corner, the door flew open. My grandma and Briona rushed in, followed by the police, who restrained Emma right away. Briona ran over yelling, I told you I didn't want any part in your schemes. I would never, ever hurt my sister. Briona? Did you know she was your real mother already? Not until after mom was gone. Then Emma told me everything. Sensing my confusion, Briona explained that Emma had a fling with our father many years ago, but he wouldn't marry her because of her lesser status. She was already pregnant with Briona at the time, so our father allowed her to stay as a nanny. When my mom married our dad, she only knew that Briona was her husband's stepchild. I'm sorry I didn't come clean sooner. I didn't know what to do. 
because I didn't realize how far she was willing to go. But when I saw her messing with your drink, I knew that I needed to at least warn you. Thank you for always being on my side and telling the truth now. It must have been even harder for you to process all these. But don't worry, we can still make this right. Emma was trying to explain away her crimes as the police escorted her away in handcuffs. They assured as justice would be served. We got in touch with mom, and by morning she was back home. After some more crying and apologizing and explaining and hugging, everything was as close to normal as it could be. I admitted that I didn't want the responsibility of running the company, but there was something I did want. I wanted to return to the Gem Island and oversee the exploration of the new mines. What I didn't say was the reason I really wanted to return. He was all I could think about as I embarked on my journey back to the island. We took a big boat as far as we could, before I needed to board a paddle boat to remain undetected once we reached native territory. Before I knew it, the island appeared on the horizon. My heart fluttered as I paddled faster and faster, waiting for the moment I could finally see Silas again. I was so focused on the land ahead that I didn't see the huge wave coming up from behind and overturned my boat. When I opened my eyes, I once again thought I was dead. This time, it was because the first thing I saw was an angel's face. Silas? Amy. Hi. I told you we'd see each other again. <laughs> but my moment in heaven was interrupted by the tribe's return. We were surrounded by the natives hollering and pounding their spears into the ground. A man angrier and more distinctively dressed than the rest stepped forward. This must be the chief. He shouted something to the others, and they grew quiet. He shouted some more, and all of their spears were pointed at me and Silas. I looked up at Silas. His face didn't change. He hugged me even tighter. Just when I thought the end was near, I heard a familiar voice. Nora was standing in between us and her father, shouting desperately. The chief's expression softened, and after some discussion between them, the chief gave another order, which made Silas very surprised. So, yes... Thanks to Nora and all the good deeds that Silas has done for the tribe. They spared our lives, but they ordered us both to leave their territory right away. So Silas and I moved to the main island, where my family's gem mine is located. Here we still have the beauty and simplicity of the wild lifestyle, while being connected to the rest of the world and helping manage our family business. So it's okay that we're not allowed to stay on the tribe's island. Not to mention, we still have a friend who often comes to visit. Nora had nagged her father to allow her to come over to our island every few days. It was at first because of Silas, but I think that she has set her sights on someone new now. <laughs> I arrived to find that he'd turned his bedroom into a mini theater, complete with scented candles and glistening fairy lights. He handed me a bowl of popcorn, and as we nibbled our way to the bottom, a carefully written letter came into sight that said, I've been in love with you ever since we were little kids. I've held back my feelings as I didn't want to ruin our friendship, but I can't deny them any longer. So, will you be my girlfriend? Ah, uh, how can he be so gorgeous and sweet and... <sighs> hey, dummy, you writing that cheesy stuff again? Just drop it already. Let's go prank Mr. Weasley. Okay, I'm coming. Hmm, if only what I wrote came to life. That's my best friend since childhood, Adrian. And as you can see, I have the biggest crush on him. But he only sees me as a bro. How ironic. I'm pretty sure if I confessed my feelings to him, he'd weird it out saying it's gross and stuff. So I just wrote my dream reality down in my novel and posted it on Wattpad. I even used a pen name. I couldn't risk Adrian finding out, cause... help? Awkward alert? Anyway, it's easier this way, as I didn't want my parents to find out either. Yep, they weren't exactly supportive of my writing career. They wanted me to become a lawyer and take over the family firm just like my dad, and his dad, and blah blah blah. They made me study hard so I'd get into this prestigious law school, but it was just so dull and my heart just wasn't into it. One day, as I was sipping a macchiato at my favorite coffee shop, a group of girls walked in chattering excitedly about a book by the new author, Agatha C. Huh? Did I hear them right? Curious, I approached them and politely asked to see the book and... Oh. My God. It was my pen name right on the cover! I scanned through the first few pages and saw my words. Did this mean... My book was published? Ouch! 
<laughs> so all this was real? So, someone must have given my book to the publisher. Then it's gotta be Mrs. Jensen. Yes, she is the most respected writer and has loads of connections in the publishing industry. And lucky me, she was my mentor. Hi, Mrs. Jensen. I'm just calling to say I'm so grateful for what you've done for me. Cecilia, calm down. What are you talking about? The book, of course. Mrs. Jensen, my book got published thanks to you. Right? You're talking nonsense, young lady. I've barely started reading your book. So how could it have been published without my notice? What? So, Mrs. Jensen didn't send it. Then, who did? What do you mean you can't disclose their identity? It's my book! Miss, all I can say is that the person who brought it here claims to be the author of the book and chose not to reveal themselves by publishing it under a pen name. We, as the publisher, are legally bound by that, so I can't help you any further. What on earth was he talking about? Some random person stole my book and my pen name? I needed to prove they were both mine. Hmm. Aha! My Wattpad page! I tried to log into my account to show the director, but access denied? Oh, no, no, no. Someone must have messed with it. I was gonna use it to apply for a writing scholarship at college, and now... It was all gone! As if that wasn't bad enough. I suddenly received an email from the writing competition I'd applied for, saying they denied my entry due to plagiarism of a Wattpad page. My Wattpad page! Ugh! So, bro, what's with the King Kong face? <laughs> oh, come on. You'd be less of an ugly duggling if you smile more. See? My gosh, could he just stop being like that for once? He made it very clear we had zero chance of being together. I got it, but he didn't have to rub it in my face like that. Fine then, he'd never have to see me again. After that, I was determined to transfer to another school by the next semester, one that would appreciate my writing talent. Somewhere like Eastwood Academy, it's a school full of literature records. Besides, I happen to know someone there. Lewis, the president of the Literature Club, and also an uprising star in the writer world. He's not only super talented, but incredibly nice, too. He'd help me loads with my novels. But getting into that school would be tough. So, every day, with my game face on, I buried my head under stacks of books, while Adrian tried his best to distract me. One time, he told me to ditch class and go see the new Batman movie with him. I'd waited months for that movie. But no. I'd got to get my head in the game. Adrian didn't give up that easily, though. Only, right at that moment, the teacher appeared behind his back, yanked his ears, and gave him a ticket to the detention room. There went the Batman movie for him. <laughs> Another time, he came up with a prank for Mr. Jones, the P.E. teacher who made him run ten laps around the school for being late. But, sorry, the new Cecilia ain't got time for any of his childish stuff. So when Adrian gave me Mr. Jones's phone and told me to hide it away, I just calmly handed it back to him. As Mr. Jones returned to the teacher lounge, he saw Adrian pouring some liquid into his tumbler, and that's how Adrian got himself two detention tickets. <laughs> After that, Adrian finally noticed that I had been acting differently. Cece, what is up with you? You keep ignoring me. Are we not friends anymore? Don't call me Cece. I'm still mad at you, okay? So, yeah, I want to transfer to Eastwood Academy. You know, Lewis's school. Oh, I see. Stop the act. I know it already. What? Did he know that I like him? Had he read my book? You like Lewis. Huh? Oh. Phew. But hang on. He really thought that? And was he annoyed? Hmm. Interesting. Yep. In fact, he asked me out to dinner this Saturday. Really? Okay, then. I'll go with you. Can't trust this guy. And so, Adrian tagged along. He kept complaining about how I dressed up all pretty for Lewis, and how he had the nerve to be late. So, this is what he's like when he's jealous? Kinda cute, though. As Lewis arrived, he gave me a big hug, and I could feel Adrian's glare behind my back. <laughs> I sat close to Lewis and giggled at everything he said. He immediately got what I was trying to do, so he acted along, putting his arm around my shoulder and slightly stroking my hair. 
At one point, I even helped Louis take a fallen eyelash out. And oh boy, Adrian couldn't help but lunge forward to separate us. Right at that moment, I heard a familiar voice from behind. Cecilia? And who are these young men? Louis? Oh, hi, Mrs. Jensen. What a small world. You know Louis, too? She didn't answer my question. Instead, she gave me a stern look, then dragged me outside. Cecilia, what are you doing with that no-good traitor? You mean, Louis? Who else? He was heavily criticized and boycotted by the whole writer's community. I strongly suggest you give him a wide berth. Oh, my. I had no idea Louis had such a bad reputation. He was always so kind to me. Unless this was just an act because he wanted something. Like my novel. What if he was the one who stole it? This was not good. I rushed back to my table, quickly said goodbye to Adrian, then dragged Louis away. Did you or did you not steal my book? What? No. Did Mrs. Jensen tell you that? Turns out, he used to be Mrs. Jensen's brightest mentee. Then he fell in love with her daughter Demi, and they started dating behind her back. But then out of the blue, Demi suddenly broke up with him. Heartbroken, he cut all ties with her and her mom. But Mrs. Jensen took offense at this and had been on his back ever since. Gosh, now my head was spinning. I had no idea who to trust. Come to think of it, back in my mentee months, I also lost one of my manuscripts. I sort of ran into a dead end with that one, so I didn't do any digging, but it can't be a coincidence, right? It must have been Mrs. Jensen who stole them. No way! She's an incredible writer. Why would she do something like that? There's no better explanation for this. Don't worry. I've got a plan to expose her for the stinking thief she is. He then called the publisher, pretending to be some big-shot producer, and asked them to arrange a meeting with the author of my stolen book, as he'd like to produce a high-budget movie based on it. Brilliant, isn't it? We arrived at the rendezvous in awesome disguises and waited for this to play out. Her tension rose as the footsteps got closer. And then, standing at the door was, well, Mrs. Jensen. How could you? I trusted you. Cecilia? What's going on? Oh, drop the act. There's no movie. We only planned this trap to expose you for the book thief you are. Mrs. Jensen persistently denied our accusations and claimed she was only here because her daughter arranged a big surprise for her. Then Lewis and Mrs. Jensen started quarreling with each other, and it all got messy. Stop! Both of you, please just stop! Demi? Please explain yourself! I... It was me, okay? I stole your book, Cecilia. I saw it on Mom's desk. I'm so sorry. I don't understand. You don't need to steal someone else's hard work. You already are an excellent writer. No, Mom, I'm not. I've tried so hard to meet your expectations, but I just can't. I didn't want to disappoint you, so I stole your mentee's work. Including yours, Louis. I was so ashamed of myself I couldn't face you after that. I'm so, so sorry. Louis let out a long sigh then pulled Demi in for a hug and comforted her. Right at that moment, Adrian barged in and grabbed Louis's collar. You jerk! You were flirting with Cecilia a day ago, and now you're canoodling with another girl right in front of her? Adrian, stop! It's not what you think! Then I led him out of the restaurant. Turns out, he saw me leaving the house with Louis looking all weird, so he decided to follow us here. Um, the truth is... I don't have a crush on Lewis. I was just trying to see if you think of me as more than just a friend. Um, well, I do like you. Like, a lot. But I don't want to risk our friendship. I can't bear the thought of not having you in my life, so I figured it'd be best to treat you as one of the guys. Guess what? I like you too, idiot. So, what do you say? Yeah, let's give it a shot. But you have to promise me if things don't work out, we'll still be friends, okay? Promise. Then we pinky swore just like when we were little kids. Only this time, he pulled me in for the best kiss ever. Finally, my book's mine again. And guess what? It has just become the number one bestseller novel according to the New York Times. Ah!
This calls for a celebration. Adrian, will you help me with the guest list for the party? Sure, sweetie. Who do you want to invite? Now, let's see. There's my parents, who were so impressed with my independent work that they're now letting me follow my writing dreams. There's also Louis and Demi. Aw, they make such a cute couple. Demi decided to start over with her writing career, this time without the pressure from her mom. And with Louis's help, she's got a bright future ahead. And last but not least, Mrs. Jensen, who's now fully supportive of her daughter's career and her relationship with Louis. <laughs> I guess it's a happy ending for both my novel, me, and everyone I care about. Ugh, look at them flirting. What an eyesore. But don't get it wrong. Trust me, this is no happy family. That woman there isn't my mom. She's Rochelle, our housemaid. I repeat, housemaid. But it looks like she has her sights set on becoming my stepmom. Ugh. We only hired her because after my mom passed away, Dad and I struggled to deal with our grief and our clumsiness as well, so tidying the house didn't take priority. I suppose Rochelle was an okay maid. Can't deny that she's a good cleaner. And her cooking is tasty. However, recently, I've noticed that she always cooks Dad's favorite meals. Also, they laugh and flirt and constantly give each other these gooey-eyed looks. Yuck! Today, she even took out her handkerchief and attentively wiped my dad's sweaty forehead. Who does she think she is? She definitely wanted to hypnotize dad. If she thought she'd have a slot in this house, she was totally wrong. I needed to do something about this. I had to talk to dad right away. Dad, mom didn't pass away that long ago, but it looks like you've already lined up her replacement. Didn't you hurt mom enough by reconnecting with your ex right before she died? What do you mean, replacement? Brittany, you're being childish and unreasonable. I don't know, and I don't care. But I want Rochelle to get out of our house immediately. She's for sure trying to get something out of you. Okay, fine. If you insist. But make sure you find a new housemaid to replace her. <sighs> so it turns out that finding a new maid who's actually good is nearly impossible. Dozens of people came to try out, but none of them were as considerate as Rochelle. Okay, after all, we still needed a maid, so I reluctantly let Rochelle stay until I found someone new. This didn't mean I was going to let my annoyance for her slide. I decided that while I was stuck in the same house as her, I may as well play some tricks on her to let out my anger. When she decided to cook, again, the divine chicken soup that my dad loved so much, I kindly added a little salt to make it more savory. But somehow, my dad still praised her delicious food. He must just be flattering her, right? So I tried it for myself. What? How could she do that? It tasted amazing. Ugh. Another time, I copied this trick I saw on TikTok by sticking layers of food wrap on Rochelle's door, then acting like there was an emergency. Quick, the oven is making weird noises. I think something's burning. Rochelle quickly ran out of the room and I couldn't help but laugh my head off. Her face was really funny. She then gave me this bewildered look and smiled helplessly. Ugh. Why did this woman never get mad? Okay then, let's step it up a notch. I decided to play the ultimate trick. Knowing that Rochelle was scared to death of cockroaches, I cut a cockroach shape out of paper and put it behind the fabric of her nightlight. That night, I was dozing off when I heard a screechy scream, ah, coming from Rochelle's room. Aha, success. But she was so terrified that she fainted. Oops! Do you know what the most annoying thing is? Even after all the trouble I've caused her, Rochelle was still super sweet to me. She was always offering me cookies and asking me about my day and stuff. I felt like she was trying to play the role of a mother, and I didn't like that at all. She couldn't fool me. I knew she only put up with me to please my dad. Thanks to Rochelle, I could never be at ease, even in my own home. But recently a very special person has come into my life and lit up my mood. It was totally by chance. That day, it had rained like crazy, so there were puddles everywhere. 
I was on my way home from the grocery store when a car drove whizzing by. I thought I was going to get a free bath, but then suddenly, an arm pulled me back and shielded me with his body, just like in a romantic movie. Standing there was a boy, soaking wet, asking if I was okay. Aww, he had totally swept me off my feet. We walked together for a while, and he told me his name's Chris, and he lives in the next neighborhood. That's it! I needed to find a way to impress Chris and also thank him for helping me. So, after some careful thinking, I decided to bake him a cake. I'd seen Rochelle bake before. It looked easy peasy. So I baked one and gave some to my best friend Sue to try. But she spat it out and said, Ew, gross. Hmm. I sadly sat in the kitchen, staring at my pathetic cake and wondered where I'd done wrong. That's when Rochelle stepped into the room. But to my surprise, instead of laughing at me, she patted me on the shoulder. Come here. I'll teach you how to cook. Rochelle was a good cook, so I'd be stupid not to learn from her. This doesn't mean I like her, though. I just want to win my crush's heart. So after that, each day after school, Rochelle gave me a cooking lesson. Okay, so maybe she wasn't as bad as I first thought. We tried out different recipes together and came up with our own perfect formula. And finally, I could bake a lovely heart-shaped chocolate cake by myself to confess my love to Chris. And you know what? He said, yes. I was so deeply in love with Chris that I totally forgot about my conflict with Rochelle. Chris often came over to my place. My dad and Rochelle loved him. So now, besides my dad's favorite food, Rochelle also makes Chris's favorites too. She's incredible. She could remember everything Chris loves and hates, even the trivia, like he's allergic to peanuts. We were just like a family, and I have to admit, it felt kind of good. And then, out of literally nowhere, the shock of my life happened. My dad passed away from cancer. I didn't even know he was ill. As you might guess, I totally broke down and didn't want to do anything after that. My mom and dad had both left me, just within a single year. But... At least I still had Rochelle and Chris beside me. Rochelle took care of me like I was her actual daughter. I was going through such a tough time in life, but having them around made me feel like I wasn't completely alone. The grief had to fade away eventually, and it's gonna be okay from now on, I thought. Until one day, I was baking cupcakes when my dad's lawyer appeared and showed me the will. Turns out, my dad had left the house to me but only on the condition that I had a guardian. Some woman named Laura. Huh? That's odd. I don't know anyone named Laura, but wait, I think I've heard this name from someone. Oh, my mom. When she was in her last days, mom once told me that my dad had been talking to his ex again, and her name was Laura. Could it be her? Did he seriously make his ex my guardian? Unbelievable! I had to get to the bottom of this, but how could I find this mystery Laura? I had no family. Well, besides my uncle Colin, who was living in France. So I contacted him and told him everything. He flew back at once, and although I hadn't seen him in years, I couldn't hold back my emotions and ended up sobbing on his shoulder. And then he told me the horrible truth. Laura is none other than the woman who had just walked through the door. It was Rochelle, the woman who had been living in my house. I couldn't believe my ears. What on earth is going on? So Rochelle moving in was no coincidence? My dad sneakily snuck her in as a maid so they could be together? My pain and disappointment were overwhelming, but I had to calm down so I could think rationally. I knew I needed to be smart and outplay Rochelle at her own game. Since then, I started watching Rochelle and noticed something strange. Rochelle and Chris were a bit too close and intimate. I often saw them whispering to each other when they thought I wasn't looking. What did this mean? Could it be that Rochelle was trying to coax my boyfriend into one of her dark schemes? Or worse still, 
Was the guy I loved cheating on me with an older woman? My suspicions deepened. When a few days later, Chris told me he was sick, so I had to take the school bus for a couple of days. And Rochelle also asked me for a few days off. Hmm, could it just be coincidence? I didn't think so, so I decided to be a detective for once. Right after Rochelle left, I started following her. And with no surprise, she went to my boyfriend's house. Hi, Mom. Excuse me? Mom? She's his mom? So that means she not only flirted with my father, but also planted her son to distract me to take over my family's property? I trusted them. How could they be so cruel? Suddenly, I remembered a detail that I didn't notice until now. After eating the food she'd cooked, for some reason, my father became weaker and weaker and eventually passed away. Did she poison him? If that's the case, then she really is a poisonous snake in human disguise. I immediately broke up with Chris and fired Rochelle, then went home and told Uncle Colin everything. At least I had him on my side. Now what we need to do is refute her custody of the property. I'll take care of everything, and you just have to do what I say. Then, Uncle Colin helped me prepare a lawsuit against Rochelle and her son for fraud. Those two will pay the price for what they did to my father and me. Oh, but the thing is, now Rochelle didn't live here, it felt so empty. <sighs> I was so angry with her, but I also found myself missing her too. I loved and trusted her, and Chris too. And feelings like that don't just vanish overnight, but when I was still thinking about it, there was the lawyer. Again! And he was accompanied by Uncle Colin. What's happening now? Miss Brittany Jensen hereby transfers the entire estate of 25 Oakwell House to Mr. Colin Jensen, as signed by both parties. Huh? Signed? When did I sign that? I snatched the paper and shouted, Scam! I never saw this paper! Uncle, what is this? Please say something! I don't know. Just follow the legal documents. No, 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 no! So Uncle Colin was just pretending to care, when really he just wanted to trick me into signing over my house? Oh God, thinking about it, it must have been that day, the day where he gave me a bunch of papers to sign, claiming that they were about me suing Rochelle and Chris. OMG, the lying con! At the time, I'd been so upset that I only skimmed the first page without looking at the following ones. I was too careless. From tomorrow, Miss Brittany Jensen will have to return all assets to Mr. Colin Jensen. You have 24 hours to prepare. I tried shouting at my uncle, and then I tried reasoning with him, but he didn't care. He just smirked at me and told me that he was just taking what was rightfully his. Ugh, what a vile man. So now... I have nothing left. I was kicked out of my own house and deceived by my own uncle. I don't know why I accidentally passed Chris's house just as he opened the door to take a delivery and our eyes met. I turned and started to run away, but Chris caught up with me and grabbed my hand. Even after the awful way I treated them both, Rochelle and Chris still invited me inside and made me dinner. I ashamedly told them what happened. Then Rochelle told me everything. It turns out that my father found out that he had cancer a while ago, but he didn't tell me because he saw how upset I was after losing mom, and he was afraid I would worry too much. Rochelle saw his health deteriorating and figured out what was wrong, so she volunteered to take care of him because she still cared for him. But as a friend, nothing more. As for the will, my dad understood Uncle Colin all too well and didn't trust him, so he gave custody to Rochelle, but unexpectedly, in the end, I still stupidly fell into his trap. As for Chris, I really didn't know you two knew each other until you brought him home. But at that time, I didn't want to confess I was his mother and affect your relationship. I'm sorry, Brittany. Britt, please stay here with me and Mom. We'll get through this tough time together, okay? That's right, darling. No matter what, will never abandon you. I, I, I'm sorry. I misunderstood you both. 
It's okay. Everything will be fine from now on. You'll never have to do this alone. Yeah, every dog has its day. This is totally not wrong. My life is nothing like my previous wealthy one, but I have something that my conniving, vulturous uncle doesn't have, and that's people who love and care about me. What my uncle did was wrong, and Rochelle and Chris are helping me to make a legal case against him. As for now, well, I still haven't given up on my passion for cooking and still practice with my master every day. <laughs> and you know what? I just won first prize at the city cooking competition. Right, I better go, as I have a big treat planned for Ugh! Why wasn't this jerk opening the door? I carried on with my thudding until my hands hurt. So it seemed like she'd gone already. What a sly fox. So the woman who lives here is my mom's friend, Carol. My mom, being the kind-hearted person she is, lent her some money to get herself out of a tricky situation. The problem being that Carol hasn't paid it back, and now she was ghosting my mom. Do you know what the worst part is? That money was for my college fund. Fueled with rage, I kicked the air to release my anger. But, oops. I watched in horror as a pebble flew through the air in slow-mo, then hit a car window. Oh, dear. Swallowing my fear, I snuck closer to the car to inspect how bad the damage was. Suddenly, the car door opened and two thugs stepped out. I tried to stay calm, apologized, and offered them some money as compensation. Unexpectedly, these guys grinned. Okay, sweetheart. If you want to make up for it, then follow us. Just like that, one of them grabbed my wrist and pulled me away. Ugh, as if they were going to harm a defenseless girl. But too bad for these two doofuses. They're actually looking at a Taekwondo black belt master here. I was about to throw an axe kick when suddenly a guy appeared out of nowhere. Don't worry, I'll take care of it. Before I had time to blink, he lunged at the guys like a warrior and ended up beaten black and blue. <sighs> really? Who's rescuing whom now? Without hesitation, I threw a few kicks that made the two thugs turn pale. They ran back to their car, and when they were out of my kicking range, they turned their heads and sarcastically said, We spared you this once. Oh, and choose a better boyfriend next time. <laughs> I looked down to see the pathetic guy writhing on the ground. Oh yeah, I'd almost forgotten about him. He was pretty useless in a fight. But hey, at least he tried to help me. So I took him to a nearby medical station to bandage the wound. His name's Tyler. He's skinny, but yeah, pretty heroic, I must say. He still seemed to be in pain, so I offered him a ride home. But he quickly refused. Okay, fine. He must have been scared off by how fierce I appeared to be. Yet, as soon as I turned my back to walk away... Wait, something's wrong with my phone. What now? Your number isn't in it. Man, it's 2022 already, and he's still using that outdated pickup line? Still, I burst out laughing, then put my number in his phone. After that... We started messaging every day. He sent the cutest memes, and it made me feel good. To be honest, I know I can be kind of intimidating, so having a sweet guy like Tyler take an interest in me made my heart flutter a little bit. And there's no denying that he's cute. A real softie. Well, he is a music school student. A legit singer-songwriter to watch out for in the future. And so, you know, we became a couple. However, it didn't take long for me to realize that there was something very strange about this guy. I mean, 100% of our dates were at fast food restaurants, and while I was ordering a Coke, Tyler would ask the staff for an extra cup and ice. I still remember how surprised I was when I first saw him surreptitiously pull out a bottle of dark-colored water from his pocket. Oh, but you're not meant to bring outside drinks in. Don't worry, this is black coffee. It's basically the same color as Coke, so no one will know. Huh? Did I hear him wrong? Turns out I didn't, as this became a regular occurrence whenever we were out to eat. <sighs> but that's not all. On a rare occasion, we went for a fruit salad with burrata cheese. I almost choked on my food when Tyler took out a container of yogurt 
and tipped all the fruit on the plate in it. Well, and here comes fruit yogurt, but I'll put it away for later. It's not so right to eat this here, isn't it? <laughs> then one day, when it was our third month anniversary, Tyler said he was going to take me to this amazing French restaurant. Wow, I was so excited as he finally broke his rules. But turns out, it was just going to be another typical Tyler date. Things had gone wrong since the first minutes. When he parked up, he started searching his car for change. He even made me look down the side of the seat. Why, you ask? All because the meter was two ninety, but he didn't want to pay three dollars and lose a dime. Seriously, a dime! He ran off to find it and left me sitting there alone and hungry for twenty minutes. When he returned, he had this huge grin on his face as he waved the dime in my face. Oh boy, I was so mad. You're probably thinking it couldn't get any worse than that, right? Wrong. Not only did he order a starter as a main dish, but he also asked if there's a discount if he didn't get dressing on his salad. After eating, he rushed off to the restroom and left me with his wallet to pay. He arrived back just as I was about to tip the waiter $10. Seeing this, Tyler leapt across the table, grabbed the $10, and switched it for a nickel. Yes, I repeat, a nickel! Meanwhile, the surprised waiter sarcastically said, Sir, thank you very much for my nickel tip. The customers close by all tutted at us. I sunk down into my seat, willing for it to swallow me up. Jeez, this was so humiliating. No surprise, I was in a bad mood as we left the restaurant. I was so annoyed I couldn't even look at him. He tried taking my arm and asked me what was wrong. Flinching away from him, I said, Seriously? Do you even have to ask? At that moment, a luxury car pulled up alongside us. The car window lowered, and O-M-G. Inside was Victoria T., this popular teen singer. Before I could register what was going on, Victoria sarcastically said, Oh, look who's here. Isn't that my poor ex? Can't gold dig me so you turn to this girl, huh? But your new plan doesn't seem to be working too well either, honey. And the car sped away. So, it turns out he's a professional gold digger? I mean, he hadn't actually asked me for any money, but there's no denying he was stingy. No wonder he never took me back to his place. There was a time when I was so tired of some family stuff at home that I just wanted to come over to his and rest for a while. But he made some excuse about his house being messy. Now I knew he was just keeping distant with me, so later he could dump me easier without any attachment. <sighs> I was so furious I made a scene, meaning to expose his cheap shots for the whole world to see. Tyler was so embarrassed he fled the scene right away. Whatever. Good riddance. And since then... I didn't hear anything from him again. But, to be honest, I also felt a bit empty not having him around. I missed getting the cute messages he used to send and the soppy look on his face as he sang love songs to me. Oh boy, I'm a big cheese ball, aren't I? Then, one weekend afternoon, I was taking a walk when I happened to see Tyler come out of a cafe. Um, does he work part-time here or something? So I hid behind a corner and then followed him. I have to admit, I was curious about where he lives. But wait, this road is so familiar. Huh? And it led to Carol's house, the woman who borrowed money from my mom. I was still full of doubt till he pulled out the key to open the door. Ugh. Like mother like son, huh? So... You both like to scam people, huh? Pay us back now. Er, uh, Stacy? Shut up! Scam's over. Pay us back. I'm sorry, but my family is... My mom's in the hospital now. So I heard him out, and turns out it was just Tyler and his mom, and his dad had run off with some other woman when he was just a little kid. Growing up, times were hard, so his mom borrowed money to pour into stock investments, intent on providing them with a better life. Unfortunately, 
This only led to huge debts. All this stress was detrimental to her health. And now she was in the hospital, and Tyler had no other way but to live frugally to pay all the debt and hospital fees. Stacy, I'm so sorry for hiding all this from you. I'll try my best to work to be debt-free and make it up to you. Oh my, my heart fell hearing Tyler say that. All the angst just disappeared. Instead, I pulled him in for a big hug. He was a doofus, and he was my doofus, and I wasn't going to risk losing him again. On my way home, I kept thinking about ways in which I could help Tyler. Suddenly, the wind blew a poster across my foot. A city's television singing competition, with the prize up to $20,000. That's it, Tyler. Why not? This was definitely a sign. I sent Tyler a picture of the poster and told him he had to join. He was also really keen on the idea and started practicing really hard every day. He texted me each time he finished practicing, sometimes even at 2 or 3 a.m. The big day arrived. Tyler looked so cute in the suit I'd arranged for him. When he hit the chorus, our eyes met, which made me feel so sentimental. But out of nowhere, Victoria got up on stage, snatched the mic from his hand, and said, My apologies to the audience, but I have to expose this person. He and his mom manipulated people into giving them thousands of dollars, then never paid them back. This kind of man doesn't deserve to be here on the stage. He'll stain the whole competition. Vic, I appreciate your feelings for me, but I already have the one whom I want to protect. I wish you could find someone good for you and better than me. Ladies and gentlemen, it's true that my family is in debt, but we do not and never run away from this. No matter how tough our lives are, I still live true to my conscience and my passion for music. I came here with a pleasant and carefree attitude, so I don't care what people say about me. I just want to give all of myself to music and the audience. Thank you. And now, I'll carry on with the performance. And then, he started singing the song he wrote for me. At that moment, the music nerd was no longer there. Instead, there was a man with incredible inner power. I'm so proud of you, Tyler. Guess what happened next? Tyler won the first prize. I was bursting with pride. Then he immediately came to my house to give my mom the money. Huh? Please take it. Thank you for helping my mom when she had a hard time. Please find it in your heart to forgive her. She's sick and could use a good friend. Oh, but the thing is... So, turns out... Tyler's mom didn't borrow my college fund money. The two moms talked each other into stock investments. When they lost it, my mom didn't dare to tell my dad and me what she'd done, so she fabricated the whole lending money story. Ugh, oh, mom. Unacceptable. After that, the three of us went to visit Tyler's mom at the hospital and gave her the prize money to pay off her debts. She burst into tears. Then the two moms hugged and apologized for being so stupid that their kids had to deal with the consequences. Crazy, huh? But you know what? Thanks to all this drama, I found the one who was also the debtor of my life. Admit it. Come on. You took my necklace, didn't you? Mindy looked at us and shook her head. She was sweating. Well, there are only three of us in this house, and if Andy didn't take it, then obviously it was you. Seriously, Cass, you got to believe me I didn't take it. But clearly she was lying, because when I rummaged through her bag, Cass's necklace was right there. Cass told her to get out of her house, and Mindy burst into tears. Poor Mindy. I really wanted to stop Cass, but she seriously hates people touching her stuff, so I just kept quiet. You see... Cass and I are pretty much joint at the hip. We've always lived in the same neighborhood, so we grew up together and shared everything. Well, almost everything. Except one little secret that would probably ruin our friendship forever if she found out about it. Andy, what are you doing? I started to stammer. Uh, um, uh, um, this is so cute. 
Honestly, I'm so upset about Mindy. I can't believe she'd do something like that. I smiled, not knowing what to say. I mean, it was me who'd exposed her. Suddenly, I felt so guilty. Right at that moment, we got to the checkout. Cass took everything out of the cart to give to the cashier. Hang on, she exclaimed. What is this? This item has the barcode ripped off. The cashier made a fuss for a while and even called the manager. Cass and I stood there for ages, trying to figure out what was going on. Cass even started crying, thinking she'd be accused of shoplifting. After about 30 minutes, the store manager came and told us we could leave. They kept the items that had no barcodes and sent us on our way. Phew, that was close. What? What do you mean? Oh, nothing. I'm just relieved that we didn't get into any trouble. Just so you know, though, that wasn't the first time we'd got ourselves into an awkward situation while out shopping. Sometimes it was the torn barcodes. Sometimes the tags were missing. Then the security alarm would always go off at the door. And all of these situations weren't just coincidences. Okay, I gotta be honest here. The thing is, I have a habit of pilfering. Not because I can't afford stuff. I mean, my dad's the owner of a bank, so money isn't the issue. My dad basically buys me the latest phone every month. And you should see my wardrobe. I have all the designer bags. I steal because it gives me the kind of thrill that my boring daily life just can't give me. My dad just hands me money every day and never stops to think that maybe I'd like a hug or a how are you ever since my mom left when I was just a baby. He's been using money as a way to keep the peace. So one day when I was in elementary school, I stole a hairpin from the girl who sat next to me. It felt so good, like my own little secret. I loved the drama that came with it. And the fact that no one ever suspected me because I was such a rich little girl. After the hairpin, I got addicted to stealing little things and couldn't stop. It felt like the only thing I could control in my life. And so I kept on doing it. And here I am now, still getting a buzz from it every single time. And yep, you've guessed it. The one who took the necklace I cast a sleepover was none other than me, of course. But at that time, because I was so scared... I slipped the necklace into Mindy's bag and pretended to find it there. I was deep in thought when suddenly Alex's scream startled me. Guys, I've lost my unicorn pen. You know the pen that glows? The whole class was suddenly in uproar. Some friends were trying to look for it. Meanwhile, Alex was walking straight towards me. Andrea must have taken it. This morning when I took out the pen, me and her were the only ones in here. I looked up at Alex my heart pounding in my chest. This is it. I'm so done this time. Then I suddenly looked over at Scott Parker, the cute boy who just transferred to our class. Oh no, I couldn't give him a bad impression of me. I had to quickly think of a way out of this. You waited until I went to the bathroom to take it, didn't you? Alex, I'd never do such a thing. Besides, I have loads of nice pens. In fact, you can have one if you'd like. I pulled out a beautiful pink rhinestone pen from my pencil case and handed it to Alex. While Alex stared in awe at my pen, I suggested everyone go check their lockers to see if her pen was there. Sure enough, right by the lockers was the glowing unicorn pen she'd lost, right in front of Scott. I picked up the pen and handed it to Alex. I'm so upset you thought I'd steal this from you, but it's okay, at least we found it. Alex blushed and apologized to me. Our other friends also blamed Alex for not looking for it carefully enough and for jumping to conclusions about me. <laughs> Next time, don't be so silly. Andrea is a good person. Besides, her family is so wealthy. Why would she need to steal a pen from you? I just smiled and walked away. Suddenly, a voice called out from behind me. It was Scott. He looked at me and said, Wow, that was totally dramatic. I'm Scott, by the way. You're Andrea, right? Um... Sorry if this is a bit forward, but here's my number. Excuse me? Am I dreaming? Of course I texted him as soon as I got home. He said he was so impressed with how I'd handled being blamed for the whole thing. Soon we were chatting every day, and eventually he asked me to be his girlfriend. I was so happy. But there was just one small problem. Ever since we'd started dating, I felt really ashamed about my bad habit of stealing things. I was determined to give it up but it wasn't going to be easy. One day, Scott came to pick me up and asked if I wanted to go to the bookstore. A bookstore? No, I don't want to go there. Can we go somewhere else? Please? Seeing me panic like that, Scott looked puzzled. 
Then he suggested we go to his place to watch a movie, which I was fine with. Hopefully there would be no temptations for stealing there. A middle-aged woman opened the door for us at Scott's place. Oh, this is Sandra, our maid. Hi, Sandra. I'm Andrea. But instead of saying hi back, Sandra just stared at me in a seriously creepy way. It actually sent shivers down my spine. After watching the movie, Scott and his mom invited me to stay for dinner. Scott's mother, Mrs. Doris Parker, was really sweet, and we had some interesting chats. While waiting for dessert, I got up to go to the bathroom. But as I stepped out there, I almost bumped into Sandra. She was just standing there staring at me again. Uh, sorry. She didn't say anything, but just kept staring at me in this weird way. Oh my gosh, why was she looking at me like that? The next morning at school, Scott told me his mother had just lost a valuable ring. She had a jewelry tray next to the bathroom sink, and after washing her hands, she'd forgotten to put her ring on. After dinner, the ring was no longer there. I comforted Scott, then made an excuse to go to the ladies' room. I needed to seriously think about this. Honestly, I'd tried my best to not get the urge to steal at Scott's place. But when I'd seen Doris's beautiful ring... No, I had to find a way to return it. No one could find out about this. And I had sworn to myself that I would never let this happen again. Hello, Sa- Huh? Where's Sandra? Oh, she was fired. Mrs. Parker said Sandra had stolen her jewelry. Anyway, may I help you? Oh, no. I had to return this ring immediately. Poor Sandra. Scott came down for me and said he'd make dinner. I glanced through the window to find Doris was having tea in the garden. This was my chance. I snuck up to her room, quietly tiptoed in, and headed towards her jewelry box. Suddenly, the light came on. Tell me what on earth are you doing here? I quickly turned around, dropping the ring to the floor. M Mindy? Why are you here? I'm Scott's cousin. So it was you who stole the ring. I can't believe my cousin is dating you. Hearing the noise, Scott and his mom ran upstairs while I was still dumbfounded and speechless. It was you who stole Cass's necklace too, wasn't it? She won't even speak to me because of you. I'm so sorry. I know it's not okay, but I couldn't stop myself. I've been feeling so guilty, so that's why I'm returning it. I was still kneeling on the ground when a hand reached out to me and helped me stand up. I'll handle this. Come on, let's have a chat outside, shall we? Turns out Mrs. Parker is a therapist. She could see I had a problem and offered to help me. I told her how guilty I'd been feeling about Sandra getting fired and asked Doris if she could call her for me so I could apologize. Thirty minutes later, Sandra arrived. As soon as Doris saw her, she apologized and offered her the job back. But no, no, ma'am, I was the one who stole it, and I deserve to be punished. I'm sorry, Sandra, I've already confessed to Mrs. Parker that I stole the ring. I didn't mean to get you fired. I just couldn't help it. You didn't do anything wrong. I, it was me? I was greedy? She is innocent. What on earth is going on? Obviously I was the thief, so why was she defending me? Why are you doing this? Do we know each other, Sandra? And that's when the truth came pouring out. Sandra was my mom. Yeah, I don't know how this is possible either. So according to her words, she'd had a huge fight with my dad when I was a baby, and she'd fled to another city where she found a job working for Scott's family. When they moved to Seattle, she came with them. Even though she was nervous about returning back to where me and my dad were, she'd carried so much guilt about leaving us, and never in a million years did she expect to bump into me at Scott's house. I was so shocked, I couldn't even speak. I'd imagined this moment my whole life, and now... Here I was, standing face to face with her, and she'd even taken the blame for me. I couldn't believe it. Mom, I'm so sorry that I stole the ring. I, I can't believe you're really here. Sweetie, you don't need to apologize. I'm the one who will be apologizing for the rest of my life, abandoning my daughter like that. What kind of mom am I? How will you ever forgive me? We stood there hugging for what felt like forever, and I knew in that moment that I'd never steal again. Doris diagnosed me as having kleptomania due to a lack of love for my mom, but now that my mom was back, I had no reason to seek out those thrills from stealing. I had everything I needed right here. There were a few moments where I almost stole again, but Doris told me to call my mom as soon as I felt the urge, and when my mom picked up the phone and I heard her voice, the urge faded, and I felt so much better. 
Scott and Cass and Mindy forgave me after Doris sat them all down and explained more about my addiction and where it stemmed from. Now, Scott and I are still together, and I see my mom every day at Scott's place. My dad hasn't forgiven my mom for leaving yet, but baby steps. Finally, I feel like everything is complete, and my pilfering is a thing of the past. Ah, now what better way is there to spend a Saturday afternoon than lying on the couch watching a feel-good movie with lots of snacks? Ugh, I suppose I better get that. O-M-G, who is this? He's the most gorgeous boy I've ever seen in my life! I stared at him in open-mouthed amazement, but then I saw him gazing back at me and realized I needed to say something. Hey, how may I help you? Hi, I'm Jaden. My mom and I have just moved in next door. Oh, in that case, welcome to the neighborhood. Jaden smiled as he held a box out to me. W was this a gift for me? Already? I took it from him and blushed out a thanks. I opened the box and saw that it was full of delicious-looking cookies. My mom baked them. She finds that people tend to be far more welcoming when it involves cookies. We chatted for a bit longer. Then he said he had to go and help his mom unpack. Aw, why did this moment have to end already? The next day at school, I couldn't wait to find my bestie Stella and tell her about my drop-dead gorgeous neighbor. But as it happens... She found me at my locker and immediately started gushing about this hot new boy. Hmm, I needed to see how handsome this guy was. My chance came at lunchtime when Stella pointed over at the new boy who was currently being pestered by Anna, this stuck-up girl from class. I squinted my eyes. O-M-G. The hot new boy was none other than Jaden. I watched on as Anna fluttered her eyelashes at him, then flicked her hair behind her back. Ugh, she needed to give the flirting a break. It was so tragic. Suddenly, Jaden saw me, smiled, then hurried over to me. Hi, Laura. Oh boy, am I glad to see you. He leaned in close to my ear and whispered, That girl is kind of freaking me out. Please, can we get out of here? Then to my surprise, he took my hand and led me away. I could see the shocked look on Anna's face, and I couldn't help but smirk back at her. Ha! Huh, take that, Anna. He's holding my hand, not yours. Then after school, Jaden and I walked home together. Turns out, as well as being the hottest guy on the planet, he was also really sweet and funny. <sighs> back home, I saw Jaden's mom. Cynthia watering her window box. On seeing us, she waved us over, then insisted on inviting me inside for homemade lemonade. We all got on so well. Looks like I'm going to have a boyfriend soon, one whose mom loves me. <laughs> From then onward, Jaden and I hung out lots. We had lunch together, we went to the library together, and always walked home together. I was pretty sure the girls at school were super jealous, especially Anna. One day, during P.E., the teacher told us we were playing dodgeball and assorted us into two teams. Anna, who was on the opposite side, wouldn't quit aiming at me. I tried my best to dodge her throws, but bang! She got me! Now, listen to me. Guys like Jaden don't like ordinary girls like you. He's mine, so quit chasing him. Furious, I yelled. I'm not chasing him. He's already my boyfriend. Um, actually, not. Yet, I was pretty sure Jaden liked me, too. Just you wait. He'll soon tire of you and come running to me. Ugh, Anna was so annoying. I needed to get my frustrations off my chest, so I ranted to Stella about her. Forget Anna. No one likes her anyway. As for Jaden, it's obvious he likes you. He's just new here and probably feels too shy to ask you out. Yeah, you're probably right. He must just be shy. But, ugh, I know Anna won't quit chasing him. Then you should make your relationship with Jaden official. Stella had a point. 
If Jaden was too shy to ask me out, then maybe I should take the initiative. Then Anna would have no choice but to back off. Ha! Huh. Tonight was the night. So I texted Jaden, I need your help with something. Let's meet at 8pm by the slide in the park. But then he messaged back saying he couldn't meet tonight as he had to help his mom with something. Right that moment, my dad arrived home earlier than usual and announced that he was taking me and my sister Megan out for dinner. Ooh, this restaurant looked nice. I walked in alongside Megan and... Huh? What were Jaden and his mom doing here? Then my dad walked over to Cynthia, kissed her on the cheek, and said, Hello, honey. Jaden and I shared astonished looks. Then we peered at the adults for an explanation. Laura? Megan? This is Ms. Green, the lady I told you about. What? I mean, I knew Dad was dating a woman named Ms. Green, but I had no idea she was Jaden's mom. Then, before we knew what was happening, Dad got down on one knee and pulled out this diamond ring and asked her to marry him. And you know what? She said yes! Oh, no. No, 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 no! They can't marry! Because then Jaden will be my brother! Megan looked delighted and hugged them both, while I stared at Jaden in bewilderment. Don't get me wrong, I really want my dad to be happy, but why her? And what about me and Jaden? After that, Cynthia seemed to always be at our house, baking cakes, humming while she dusted and cleaned up, and exchanging gooey looks with my dad. Ew. Then one day, she insisted that Megan and I went wedding dress shopping with her. She tried on this one dress, and yeah, okay, she looked pretty good in it. But when she asked me what I thought about it, I just shook my head and said, well, it's not very flattering, is it? She tried on several more dresses, but I managed to find fault with them all. Then, when I noticed how disheartened she looked, I patted her shoulder and said, Don't worry, Cynthia. You can always postpone the wedding until you find a suitable dress. She looked a bit taken aback, but then she just smiled at me and said, That's okay, Laura. I'm going to go with the first one. Ugh. Anyway, now the dress was chosen, so at least I could go home now, right? Wrong. As on the way home, we passed an arcade. Cynthia led us there and then excitedly challenged me to a game of air hockey. Then I said jokingly, Fine, I'll play, but if you lose, you don't deserve to be my mother. And guess what? She won! Ugh! And worse still, Megan wouldn't quit giving me dirty looks for the comments I'd made. Jeez, I was just joking. What is wrong with you today? I plopped down on the couch and blurted out everything. She'd take my side, right? Um, turns out, no, she wouldn't. What? You and Jaden aren't even official. But Dad loves Cynthia. They both deserve happiness. So stop being a brat about it. Then she stormed off to her room. Ugh, I feel like I'm going crazy. I have huge feelings towards Jaden, and I know he feels the same. So why can't my sister be mature enough to understand that and support me? I needed to vent to someone. Luckily for me, I had Stella. Why does no one care about my feelings? I can't be Jaden's sister. Um, sorry, Lara. I don't know what to say. Suddenly, from the nearby table came a lousy voice. So that's the reason why Jaden has to hang out with you? You're pathetic, Lara. Turns out we were so lost in conversation, we didn't notice Anna and her flock sitting at the table behind us. Actually, we've been into each other for ages. It's not our fault our parents made some dumb decision. Anyway, whether we can be together or not, it doesn't change the fact that you bore him so much that he'd choose watching paint dry over being with you. How dare you! She was about to grab my hair, but right at that moment, a hand stopped her. 
It was Jaden. That afternoon, on our walk home, I finally came clean to Jaden. I like you a lot. I have always been since I first met you. I know you like me too, but you think it'll be awkward because our parents are getting married. Maybe if we just tell- Laura, you're such a sweet girl. And I do like you. But just as a sister. What? How could he say that to me? He had to like me. Didn't he? Feeling an unexplainable amount of shame and embarrassment, I ran away from him. As I lay on my bed and rubbed my tear-stained eyes, all I could think about was how unfair this was. So, by the time Dad called me down for dinner, and I walked in and saw how happy he looked, my anger got the better of me and I yelled, I hate you, and I hate Cynthia! How dare you try and replace Mom! Then I rushed back to my room. You really upset Dad. You know that, right? I didn't answer. I was also upset, but no one seemed to care about my feelings. Dad said we come first, so if you really feel this strongly about it, then he'll cancel the wedding. To be honest, I'm real mad with you right now. So? What about me? You're so immature and selfish! I didn't understand how my own sister could be so uncaring. So I screamed out. So what? You don't care that mom's being replaced by some fake woman? And what about me? Why does no one care how I feel? Oh my god, Laura, for once, this isn't about you! Megan rolled her eyes at me, then stormed off. Finally, everyone quit going on about the stupid wedding. But why didn't I feel good about this? Cynthia didn't seem to be coming round to our house anymore. And I noticed how Dad's cooking seemed to get worse and worse, until he stopped altogether and just ordered takeout. Meanwhile, Jaden wasn't anywhere to be seen at school. Stella asked around to find out where he was, and turns out he'd left, as he was moving back to his old town. No way! After school, I rushed straight over to his house and barged inside to find him and his mum packing. Are you... moving away? Yeah. I moved here to settle down and start a new life with Randall, and this house is for Jaden's future. But the wedding's been cancelled, so... I quickly asked Jaden if we could talk outside. My mom's cried so much. Randall's her soulmate, and she can't stay around her if she can't be with him anymore. The most annoying part is that she agrees with him that the kids must come first. So... I hope you're happy now. Oh my god. What have I done? His words were like a stab to my gut. Oh no. This was all my fault. I was so obsessed with Jaden that I didn't stop to think about what was best for everyone else. Without saying another word, I ran back home and burst into the kitchen where Dad was drearily staring into his iced coffee. Dad, you deserve to be happy with Cynthia. So. Please go and tell her how you feel before she leaves for good. But it was too late. Cynthia and Jaden had gone. Just kidding! <laughs> nah. Actually, Dad managed to catch Cynthia just in time, and he told her how much he loves her and can't live without her. So, guess what? Yep, they got married. And now they're both happier than ever. I've learned the hard way that being selfish and inconsiderate of other people's feelings for my own gain just makes everyone miserable, including myself. So now we're one big happy family. And I suppose having Jaden as a brother isn't actually so bad after all. I'd just climbed back into the room when suddenly I heard a voice. Jasmine, how come you're only getting home now? I turned around to find Emma standing there. That's my business. Don't come home late like this again, okay? You'll be grounded if your dad finds out. I shrugged and closed my door without saying anything. Yep, that's Emma, my stepmom. She doesn't actually care. She just pretends to. If it wasn't for her telling my dad to forbid me from singing, then I wouldn't have to sneak out to go practice like this. 
Different day, same story. Yet again, I've had to lie about going to my singing practice. Honestly, I can't wait to be an adult so I can do whatever I want. Dad, I'm going over to Mix to study, I said as I headed for the door. Suddenly, Emma pulled me back and handed me a bottle. Huh? Licorice tea? Drink this after practicing. It helps keep your voice clear. Then she winked at me. Huh? So she knew I'd lied about where I was going, yet still she'd helped me? Maybe, just maybe, I've been misunderstanding her this whole time? Later that night, Emma suggested we should go for a picnic on the weekend, and for once, I excitedly agreed. But when the weekend rolled around, there was this hectic snowstorm. Ugh. Emma kept looking out at the snow, with disappointment written across her face. Ugh. That's when the idea hit me. How about we have an indoor picnic? Yes, that's right. That's a great idea. And so, we set up the tent right in our living room, and we were having the best time, when suddenly, the doorbell rang. I got up to answer it, and standing there, covered in snow, was a woman. She suddenly ran at me and said, Oh my gosh, Jasmine, you've grown up so fast! I've missed you so much! Before I could understand what was going on, Dad shouted, Megan, I can't believe you have the nerve to show up here like this! I know you won't accept my apology, but you don't understand. I had to see her. I've missed her every single day. Oh my god. So, that woman was my mother? I couldn't hold back my tears and ran straight over to hug her. I swear I had been waiting for this moment for years. Mom gently stroked my hair and then turned to my dad. Can I stay here for a while? Just to make it up to my beloved daughter after such a long time being apart, Elvis. Are you joking? Get out of my house. Dad, please let her stay. Please. But no matter how much I begged, Dad wouldn't give in. And so I turned to Emma for help. Elvis, just let her stay here. If Jasmine wants to be with her mom this badly, we should let them have some time together. Come on, darling. I looked at Emma with so much appreciation, then turned those puppy eyes towards my dad, and eventually he reluctantly nodded his head. Yay! I shouted and led mom to my room. From that day onwards, I spent most of my free time with her. We went to the movies together, shopping together, and honestly, it was the happiest I'd ever felt. One day, I was listening and humming along to my music when mom came in. Wow. So, you also love singing? It must be genetic. Back then, if I hadn't been so passionately obsessed with music, which drove your dad crazy, I might never have left you like that. Now, I regret it so much, Jasmine. I put my arms around her and softly said, After all these years, I still think about that lullaby. Can you sing it to me? Which one? I sang you many lullabies back then. It's... Don't Know Why by Nora Jones. Oh, right. That one. Then she started singing. I swear to God, her voice was like an angel. But strangely, it didn't give me any of the feelings I had as a kid. Was it because I have grown up? While I was absorbed in my thoughts, I suddenly saw Emma's shadow at my doorway. But when she met my eyes, she hurried down the stairs. Huh? Why was Emma crying? I was so confused. She must be jealous of our relationship, Mom said. Yeah, probably, since she'd been married to my dad for three years, but we'd never been close. That evening, when I went to the kitchen with Mom to set the table, she suddenly shouted, Oh my gosh! Why did Emma make chicken parmigiana? Doesn't she know that your dad hates this? Then she took the plate and threw it in the trash, saying she would order takeaway instead. Huh? Dad hates this? He always complimented Emma on her signature dish. Before I could react, Emma entered the room. As soon as she saw her chicken in the trash, she glared at Mom. Things then got so awkward. Emma had skipped dinner. Mom also tried to start a conversation with Dad a few times, but he ignored her. Ugh, I felt so bad for Mom. In my Dad's eyes, there was only Emma now. But my mother had done nothing wrong. She just wanted to pursue her passion. Later that night, I was heading to the pantry to get some snacks when I heard Emma yelling at Mom. Megan, for old time's sake, 
I didn't bring up anything from the past, but you can't just do whatever you want. How dare Emma yell at my mom like that? As soon as Emma left, I ran over to my mom asking her what had happened. She hesitated for a while, then told me the whole story. It turned out mom and Emma used to be in the same band when they were young. And since mom was always the lead singer, Emma had begrudged her ever since. Perhaps she has never gotten over it. Ugh, I didn't expect Emma to be so mean. So from that day on, I began to show my attitude towards Emma. I didn't let her go to the parent-teacher conference like I had promised before. And I even forbade Mick, my best friend, from talking to her every time he came over. Mom, how did you and dad meet back in the day? Well, back then, your dad was a waiter at the lounge I used to sing at every weekend. We quickly fell in love and started leaving love letters for each other at our secret spot. Ew, how cheesy. It's called romantic, you silly. At that time, we put our initials at the end of every letter. Suddenly, there was some noise at the door, and I turned to see Dad standing right behind us. What do you mean, our initials? It represented our two favorite characters' names from that movie. Yes, it was the initials of Monica and Quincy in the movie Love and Basketball. Dad gaped at Emma in surprise as she continued. I was the one writing letters to you that year. But when I got to the meeting spot, I saw you and Megan together. So I left. Dad and Emma looked at each other, then turned to stare at Mom. Actually, back then I liked you so much that I pretended to be Emma. But it's not that important. In the end, you were still into me and we got along really well, right? I can't believe you lied to me like this for all these years! Then Dad angrily left the room, followed by Emma. As for Mom, she was sitting there, tears pouring from her eyes. Okay, so Mom was definitely in the wrong, but did Dad need to treat her like that? Who doesn't make mistakes from time to time? And anyway, it's because of my mom's mistake that I'm even here, right? From that day onwards, the atmosphere in the house was so intense. Dad ignored Mom, and Emma always gave Mom hateful looks. Until one day... I'd just gotten home from school when I saw my dad excitedly running towards me saying, Emma is pregnant. You're going to have a little brother or sister. Wow. I'd always wanted to have a sibling. I couldn't believe it. So that night, my family threw a party to celebrate. And mom also congratulated dad and Emma. And thanks to that, the tension between the three of them started to ease. Phew. But a few days later, for some reason, dad found out that I'd lied about going studying with Mick. He was furious and grounded me for a week. I was sullenly playing on my iPad when mom entered the room. Emma must be the snitch. Now that she's pregnant, she wants dad to be angry with you, so he'll give all his love to her and the baby. Well, that just made sense. The other day, I'd even seen Emma whispering something to dad, and as soon as he heard it, he got mad. Ugh, such a two-faced woman. I had to sort this out, and so I set up a fun plan for my stepmom. One time, I made her orange juice using powdered cheese, and she ended up spitting it out all over Dad. (laughs) Then I unscrewed the shower head to add blue food coloring, and that's how I gave her a Smurf makeover. It was hilarious hearing her horrid scream from the bathroom. Another time, I snuck into Emma's room, trying to put flour in her hair dryer. I was rummaging through the bedside table looking for her hair dryer when suddenly I saw a DVD labeled Jasmine 0311. Huh? What's this? Why was my name on it? Curious, I went back to my room to play it. And then I couldn't believe my eyes. On the screen, Emma was carrying a baby and singing a lullaby to her. This melody. Wasn't it the song Don't Know Why? So that baby was me? But Emma couldn't sing, could she? Her voice was weak and sounded hoarse. What did this mean? I rushed to show my dad the DVD. Emma told me not to talk about this, but since you already know, I won't hide it anymore. Then he told me everything. Turns out my mom left for a rich man when I was only two years old, and it was Emma who came and helped my dad take care of me during my younger years. Oh my gosh. What? So all those memories of my mom's warm hugs and lullabies were all actually of Emma? A feeling of guilt welled up in my heart. I had to do something to apologize to Emma. So the next day, I asked Mick to go to the mall to help me buy her a gift. As I was passing a coffee shop, I suddenly saw my mom sitting with some guy. 
Without thinking much, I quickly pulled Mick to a nearby table and eavesdropped on them. Honey, how's the money? You know how pushy the creditors are, and they're getting kinda aggressive. Don't worry, it won't be long now. My daughter's on my side. She'll help me kick her stupid stepmom out. Then my ex-husband will soon follow her wish and volunteer to give me money. What? What was going on? Had mom come back just for dad's money? I was about to go confront her when my phone rang. It was dad. Jasmine, go to the hospital right away. Emma is in the emergency room. By the time I got there, I saw my dad sitting outside the ER with his head in his hands. After a while, the doctor came out and said, Both mother and baby are okay. Next time, please pay more attention to the patient's food allergy. How could you eat stuff you're allergic to? You must be more careful, okay? Yeah, Emma always took good care. It didn't make sense. Unless... my mom... I was about to tell dad about what I'd seen at the mall when mom suddenly appeared, eagerly asking about Emma's situation. Unable to stand her pretense any longer, I shouted, Mom, drop the act. It was you who did all of this, wasn't it? Jasmine, what nonsense are you uttering? Furious, I immediately told them the whole story I've heard. Megan, I could forgive you for the old letter story and for trying to sabotage my voice, but the fact that you wanted to harm my baby is unforgivable. It turns out the stuff from the past that she mentioned before was that my mom harmed her to destroy her voice. So that's why dad didn't let me sing, for fear that it would cause Emma pain. Suddenly, Mom burst out laughing. (laughs) I don't need your pity. You were so lucky to have such a beautiful voice and a wonderful man by your side. And even now, you're still trying to take the life that should have been mine. Megan, give it up already. You need to stop this. Mom was about to say something, but I interrupted her. Mom, please just go. I'm so ashamed to have a mother like you. Then I burst into tears. She got up and left, without even so much as a glance back at us. Emma took me into her arms. I was afraid that you would be disappointed. That's why I hid everything from you. I'm sorry for treating you so badly. She gently patted my head, and I felt like I was back in my childhood, where she'd held me and sang lullabies. It was so comforting. Finally, peace has returned to my family. I'm so fortunate to have Emma as a stepmom, and pretty soon... My little bro or sis will be here, and I can't wait. Hello, hallway. Hello, classmates. I, Taya, have finally returned to school after three months. What the what? What's with everyone's goggled-eyed looks? The boys were all slipping off their chairs. Had I morphed into Jenna Ortega at the summer break or something? Oh, turns out there's a new girl standing behind me. Are you the new student? Let me show you around. Oh, boys. Weren't they forgetting something? Their existing girlfriends? Which they were only with because of me. Anyway, I'm Taya, aka Stalking Lord, ruler of all information in school. Just give me a full name and some of your allowance money, and I can dig up the 411 on your crush. These idiots only impressed their girlfriends due to my incredible talent. And now they're all over this Mira girl? (laughs) Do they have no shame? Unlike me, once I like someone, then my eyes don't wander. The one and only Adonis of my heart is Colin. He's so sweet. He has this shining halo when he plays basketball. And most importantly, he's flawlessly handsome. But I hadn't told him how I felt. Because, as you can see, he's not short of admirers and nothing seems to impress him. So I was still trying to figure out the best way to get on his radar. My everyday joy was quietly observing him from afar. But wait! What happened to his car? What's with all the silly scribbles? Finn, the troublemaker, and his minions were standing nearby laughing at my Colin. Ugh! Those notorious rebels for some reason seem to thrive off tormenting poor Call. So you're a vandal now, huh, Finn? Look who's talking. Oh, I see. The nude team captain? Finn threw the spray can at Call, then left. Why isn't Colin doing anything? Maybe he doesn't want to rise to such petty idiots? Then let me handle this. I know exactly what his Achilles heel is. A few days later, I secretly put a small box in Finn's locker and watched on as his minions gathered around excitedly gawping at it. They too must be amazed that their big man's finally getting a love confession time, huh? 
Finn smugly opened the box but then freaked out and threw it in the air. The cockroaches escaped and ran rampant across the hallway. It's pure chaos. <laughs> A bunch of wimps. Oh, he finally discovered the note I attached. Finn was fuming and shouted that he would find the instigator. I could see Colin walk off from the crowd. If only he knew what I did for him, he'd be so impressed. But nope. Finn took zero notice of my warning and continued to bother Colin. Ugh, I can't let him get away with this. That gremlin needs to learn some serious lessons. Finn always stays late after school to sneak up to the terrace and practice skateboarding. So I schemed to get him stuck in the elevator. He'd be trapped there for at least an hour. Enough time for that claustrophobic peacebreaker to read the second warning letter and apologize for what he did. There he is. Time to leave. I ducked my head, gently stepping out of the elevator. When suddenly, Finn grabbed my wrist and pulled me back. How long are you going to play Beauty Saves the Hero, huh? How could he know? It turns out that Finn's minions happened to see a bunch of pictures of Colin decorated with hearts in my locker. And they even found a list of Finn's weaknesses in my bag. Just one cute puppy can make him scream like a little girl? Suddenly, the elevator stopped. Oh no, I didn't mean to trap myself here like this. With this punk. You did this too, right? You've gone too far. Tell you what, be my servant for a month and I'll let you off. <laughs> As if. Stay away from Colin and I'll stay away from you. You don't even know his true face. I doubt you'd still like him if you did. Anyway, I heard that the principal is desperate to get his hands on the cockroach culprit. Your choice. Do you want to pay the price to him or to me? Ugh, he's got me. But what does this Finn know about Colin that I don't? Okay, just one month. And don't think it'll be easy to be my boss. Heh, <laughs> nice. Then I have first order for you already. And so, I had to sing and dance to entertain him until someone came to rescue us. In the following days, the bossy Finn kept sending me on dumb errands and rebuking me for every single thing. Hmm, there's no denying that this guy was a gifted painter. It's just a shame about his lousy personality. As soon as someone spotted us, he immediately skated away, leaving me running after him. He didn't study either, so I had to do all his homework. He even made me run around the school just to buy him some snacks. This time, Finn asked me to put this cake on Miss Watterson's desk. Did he finally do something nice? No! How foolish I was! Turns out he'd injected food coloring into it to prank our teacher, and he took a video of me placing it on her desk to slander me. You have to stay after school and film me every skateboarding session, or else I'll tell her. That guy has gone too far. Is he forcing me to work over time now? And since I have been busy being Finn's puppet, I didn't even have time to look after Colin anymore. I've tried several times asking why he hates Colin that much, but every time I mentioned it, he got all touchy. And there's one more thing that intrigued me. There was something up with Finn's leg. Hey, does your left leg hurt? It's perfectly fine. Don't act like we're close. Why do you have to be so sensitive? No wonder no one likes you. Oh, please. Being liked by someone like you would be a nightmare. The only girl on my level in this place is Mira. She's sweet and gentle. Besides, she's only been here five minutes and she has already established an art club. <laughs> he can't compare the Little Mermaid to Princess Merida. We're basically just different. Heard you're the one who knows everything at school, right? Find out about her for me. It might be our last mission. For what? Are you going to put her in trouble too? <laughs> well, this proves that a know-it-all like you doesn't know anything about me. It's just like you don't understand your Colin at all. Just give this to Mira. Remember to do it in a private place so she doesn't feel awkward. Oh, he even drew the card himself. This side of rebellious Finn really surprised me. But come to think of it, if Finn was too busy with love, he wouldn't torture me anymore. Under Finn's instructions, I went to school early the next day to find his muse. As soon as I saw Mira, I immediately chased after her, but was she talking to Colin? Why do they look so sneaky? I don't get it. Why do you want to hide this? I've just transferred here. I don't want your harem bothering me. So in front of others, just pretend we're strangers, okay? Huh, <sighs> fine. See you after school then. I'll pick you up. Okay, see ya honey bun. What was that? Are they dating? This isn't good news at all. 
Right at that moment, Finn came to ask me, Why haven't you passed her the card? What happened? Then I told Finn what I just saw. Colin offered to pick her up after school, then Mira even called him Honey Bun. Looks like my first love has ended before it had even began. But they don't even have the guts to make it public? Colin doesn't deserve Mira. But that's okay. I've got a plan. So according to his scheme, basically, we needed to separate them. Then I'd take Colin, and Finn would take Mira. That day after school, I assisted Finn in flattening Colin's tires. I know, I hated causing trouble for my beloved Colin. But this is the only way to give Finn an opening to offer Mira a ride because she was in a hurry to get to her ballet class. The day after, Finn helped me draw Colin as a partner for my chemistry project. During class, I was super excited and nervous when sitting next to my Adonis. Until I noticed Colin writing something to Mira and leaving it on her lab table. I immediately dragged Finn to steal the letter. Don't forget, today we have to pick Tommy up. And mom asked what you wanted for dinner. Was their relationship progressing this fast? Colin had already introduced Mira to his family. We couldn't let the two just simply meet up like that. So we stalked and followed them to a preschool. Upon catching sight of them with a the little boy, Finn suddenly blurted. What? Don't tell me that boy's their son. No, it's just Colin's little brother. Tommy, age 5.5. Favorite color? Green. Favorite food? Ice cream. Anyway, my eyes itch seeing them happy with each other. Let's sabotage them. So, we kidnapped the kid. Oh, it's not as bad as you think. We just took him for ice cream without telling Colin and Mira. That kid doesn't look worried at all. Why be worried? You saved me from those boring two. So, Tommy, do you know that Mira is having dinner with your family tonight? Um, yeah. Mira, she stays at our house every day. What? what? Another chocolate ice cream, please, then I'll talk. I gave him a new cup of ice cream right away. This kid was smart. Well, she stays with us because she's... our cousin. What? what? Why did she call Colin Honeybun then? Maybe because mom calls him by this embarrassing nickname all the time. Right at that moment, Mira rushed into the ice cream shop in panic. So, you guys are cousins? Why hide it from everyone? It's because she's afraid people will find out that her parents are bankrupts. No, that's not true. Don't listen to that kid. Yes, it is. I heard you telling Colin all about it. Okay, that's the reason. But please, don't tell anyone about this. I quickly said that we would agree if Mira went on a date with Finn. The guy looked shocked. Didn't think I could be so quick-witted, huh? Surprisingly, Mira smiled and said she didn't mind going on a date with Finn anyway. She always thought he's kind of cute. Huh. So everything is just that easy? <laughs> that means my servant life will finally end here. Only then did Colin rush over. Tommy, why are you here? Oh, I just got lost so they saw me and bought ice cream to calm me down. They didn't kidnap me at all. Oh, Tommy. So that's how Mira and Finn got their first date. The deal between me and Finn is considered to be over then. But why do I feel so empty instead of relieved? Suddenly, something hit my leg. Aren't you supposed to be on a date? I knew my servant would still be waiting for the boss right here. Turns out, their date was a bit... odd. Mira didn't seem to like Finn's antics. And Mira's neediness wound Finn up. So this is definitely their last date. I laughed out loud, but Finn quickly stopped me. How about you and Colin? Still don't have the guts to confess? I may have successfully protected my Adonis, but I don't know why. It's like there's something that keeps holding me back from confessing. Finn immediately took me to get a makeover. He's a very enthusiastic consultant and seems to be very knowledgeable about Colin's tastes. When seeing me in the new dress, he even said I looked cute. Okay, where had rude Finn gone? What do you think of me and Colin becoming a couple? What do you mean? I mean, you used to say that Colin was terrible and all, but now you're willing to help us get together. Actually, he's not that bad, and I'm doing this for you. You like him, right? Yeah, I like Colin, right? Hmm, why did my feelings seem vague? What had gone into my head? The next day at school, when I appeared in front of Colin with my new look, he seemed impressed. And you know what? He even suggested going on a date with me. Um, yay! But I'm not sure I could last a whole date in this tight dress and super inconvenient high heels. During our date, Colin was just as sweet and caring as I expected him to be. But weirdly, it didn't move me at all. 
Is it cause I'm too focused on keeping balance on these stupid high heels? Taya, do you want to be my prom date? If he'd asked me this a month ago, I would have leaped in joy and sung out yes. But right now, I just stood there, silent. <sighs> I see. I really like this version of you, but your previous look might suit you better. You seem more comfortable and carefree around Finn. Oh, Finn. I didn't realize he has always been on my mind till now. I'd long to be free of him, but now he's all I could seem to think about. Curious, I asked Colin why Finn didn't like him, and I finally found out the truth. Turns out, they used to be friends and were once on the basketball team together. Finn was the best player back then, but at one practice, he was doing a high jump when Colin also jumped to get the ball. They collided and Finn injured his knee, which ended his professional basketball dreams. Colin then became the star player. Meanwhile, Finn turned rebellious and had resented Colin ever since. Feeling guilty still, Colin was willing to suffer all the tormenting Finn had done to him. That's why Finn always caused you trouble. He still got me a makeover though, to match your style and become a thing with you. Oh, that explains why you seem to be exactly my type. He knows me too well. But, Taya, you like Finn, right? If so, you should go and tell him. That hit me hard. Maybe I've been trying to deny it the whole time, but I really did feel the most comfortable around Finn, and I miss hanging out with him. But he seems to like someone soft and girly, like Mira. Guess you're gonna find it out for yourself. So I gathered all my courage and came to the skate park to find Finn. He saw me from afar. Hey, how was your date? You look the part. I didn't expect you to be back this early. I know about the secret between you and Colin, and how you lost your opportunity of becoming a professional basketball player. If my bestie hates him, I hate him too. Actually, I don't hate him. I just hate how useless I am. Don't talk about yourself like that. You know that you're really talented, right? You're the first guy I've met who can skate, paint, and well, is good looking at the same time. Be more confident, will you? You know, no one's ever seen nice things like that in me before. But this doesn't matter, because you like Colin. I did like Colin, but we realized we're not actually a very good match. After an awkward silence, we both raised our voices at the same time. I you know, think- Oh, oh you, you go, go first. first. I'm listening. I think I like you. Um, well, that was I was about to say. Let me be your servant this time. Hey there, I'm Evie from Georgia. So, I look like a regular teenage girl, right? <laughs> Just you wait till you see what I can do. Kids these days are so rude and unruly. I blame the parents. There's just no discipline anymore. See, they don't even respect their principal. But no big deal. I know just how to handle them. There we go. Just a few words and the class immediately went silent. What is this, Mrs. Gardner? That trip was all we've been looking forward to for months! Thanks to everyone's disruptive behavior. Well, to be exact, thanks to the actions of you, 25 out of 300 students, no one has anything to look forward to this year. Okay then, go on ma'am, punish us! But why drag the whole year group into this? Other classes will definitely not leave us alone after this. Nobody likes being punished. That's why it works. Now, let's see what your peers make of this, shall we? The whole class was buzzing with, So unfair! Abuse of power! Wicked witch! Oh my! These kids, always full of energy. Go back to your seats and write an apology letter to Miss Helen, along with a promise to never misbehave again, or else. All of them reluctantly sat down. And there we have it. Oh my god. Who are you? I... I... Um... It's just that these unruly students need to learn a lesson for getting Mrs. Helen so exhausted that she ended up in the hospital. And so you just decided to mimic me. Well then, please inform your mum. We will have a talk about this. Here, tomorrow morning. I glumly walked home as slowly as possible. As soon as I walked through the door, Mum was glaring at me. Yup, my mom is Miss Helen, the kindest homeroom teacher ever. 
However, the kids in her class made her life a misery, which led mom to get high blood pressure and end up in the hospital. I just wanted to help her, but instead, I just managed to make things worse. <sighs> Hi, mom. I'm sorry, but I don't regret what I did. Mom started lecturing me about how it was bad enough that dad had left and her students were rebellious without me acting like a crazy person. Crazy person? She means the times when I copy the people I want to be? But that's my hobby. I inherited that passion from my father, a famous special effect makeup artist. The feeling whenever I successfully transform into someone else is awesome. And it also helps me feel connected to my dad, even though I haven't seen him in a long time. It all started when I was 13, and dad helped me dress up as my fave idol for the school festival. Dad taught me how to analyze the character and practice the disguise. Bold eyeliner, smoky eyes, contouring, plus the bodycon outfits. I looked like a real CL from 2NE1. My friends loved my new look. So over the next few years, I masqueraded into many different people, including Lady Gaga, Avril Lavigne, Miley Cyrus, and Sia. The feeling that my makeup talent was that admired and anticipated was just really addictive. Hey, is it Billie Eilish this time? Why not Taylor Swift? I love her so much. I've always done whatever I want and always been exactly who I am. Wow, you got that spot on. Are you a shapeshifter or something? Needless to say, once I imitated someone, I made sure I got their gestures and mannerisms just right. My talent didn't stop at awesome makeup. I was trying to collect things from my locker when a stampede of students raced past me and almost knocked me off my feet. Huh? Who was that strange and rather handsome guy they were chasing? Look at him swaggering. Does he think he's Donald Trump or something? That's Xander. He just transferred here. Keep your voice down, by the way. You don't want to annoy his fan base. Poof. I'm not afraid of those way too girly girls who go crazy for boys. Huh. <laughs> no one scares you, do they, Evie? Now let's go have some granola. Leo may like boring granola, but no thanks. I'm having a hamburger and fried chicken. Billie Eilish is not the type to turn down delicious food for health freak nonsense. Oh, there's that obnoxious Xander again. But this time he's all over Kayla, the snooty hot girl from my class. A boy approached me asking to take a selfie with me, then suddenly I heard a scream. What do you think you're doing? I turned to see what was going on and saw Kayla going ballistic at some poor girl who'd accidentally tripped over and fallen into Xander's lap. What on earth do you think you're doing? Take a look at yourself before trying to attract my man, ugly doofus. How snobby. Did she think her beauty was that splendid to help her keep her man? But not with that empty head, girl. After a few days of research, I showed up at school looking just like Kayla. I'd perfected everything from her blonde hair, makeup, clothes, walk, and voice. Honestly, this time I was quite nervous. Dressing up as someone I actually knew was always extra scary, especially when her friends were walking over. Wow, that dress is so chic. You really are the fashionista of our school, Kay. Come on, Xander's waiting for us on the sports field. Please, do you think I really want you around? I'm just taking advantage of you. And you, you keep following me around like a pet. It's so tragic. Are you crazy? I know you like Xander too. I see the gooey looks you give him. When I'm done with him, I'll consider giving him to you. I walked away leaving the girls freaking out. But I didn't say anything different from what Kayla thought though, right? If only she would be so frank with her friends. Now let's get to the main target. Thinking about him gave me goosebumps. I'm busy, bae. Go hang with your friends for now. He was playing Call of Duty on his phone. I was here to break up with him, but hang on a minute. This guy had skill. I want to have a go. Since when did you know how to play this game? Hmm. He looked kind of touched that I was showing an interest. Okay, I'll wait until after this, and then we will split up. I looked for Leo, but he didn't even recognize me. 
Poor him. He'd been searching for Billie Eilish since morning. While Leo was complaining, he helped me quickly remove my makeup so I could go back to looking like me before anyone guessed what I'd just done. From that day onwards, Kayla's friends cut her off, so she could only cling to Xander. And from my point of view, he seemed to be tired of this clingy girl. Now even her look made him sick, huh? The time has come. I put makeup on as Kayla again and found him. I want this bag. Don't try to trick me with a fake one. Okay, as you wish. I want you to give up COD. That way you can only stay by my side. Okay, I'll follow you all day. I want to throw a party and invite the whole school. Your task is to get everyone to gather around me like they used to. If you can't do that, we'll break up. Deal. But I see everyone likes you. Right, Evie? Holy mother! Did he recognize me already? But since when? I have to acknowledge your talent. If only you hadn't shown me your charm, you wouldn't have been exposed. Well, Kayla looks like a picture, but a dull one compared to you. You have such a good eye. However, you're no different from her. Miss Helen is your mom, right? Don't be surprised. I'm a better observer than you think. Just like you. I know that Kayla was the instigator of the disturbance in the class that sent your mom to the hospital. I already apologized to your mom for Kayla's behavior. And if you want to know why I did that, it's because... I have a big crush on you. Oh my god. I didn't expect things to turn out this way. But, okay. Taking it as a slap in the face for Kayla on behalf of my mom, I still agreed to date him. The next day, I showed up again at school as Ariana Grande, simply because I wanted to. But this time, I also played another role. Xander's girlfriend. As usual, every time I dressed up as a new character, all eyes were on me. But this time, it was more epic when I walked side by side with the hottest guy in school. When Leo saw that I was with Xander, he rolled his eyes at me, then walked off. Then Kayla walked around the corner, saw us together, and started shouting at me. How dare you steal my man? You're just some pathetic wannabe! Xander took my arm and yelled at her. Evie's creative, sweet, and really funny. I want to be with her. I like her. Kayla's face dropped. Then she pointed her finger in front of him. How could you do this to me? I will get you back for this. Then she huffed off. Xander looked at me and asked if I was okay. Then he invited everyone to a party at his house that night to celebrate the fact that I was now his girlfriend. Was he serious? But whatever. It would be rude to say no, right? So that evening, I went to his party. To my surprise, Kayla was already there. So I flirted with Xander to annoy her further. Then suddenly, Xander leaned in close to my face, which made my whole body feel hot. What was happening? He... he was going to kiss me? But then he whispered in my ear, You haven't told me how you feel about me yet. <laughs> you were looking forward to this answer, weren't you? I... But before I could reply, Leo appeared out of nowhere, grabbed my hand, and dragged me out of there. Ugh! What on earth are you doing? I'm the one who should be asking you that question. What on earth were you going to say? That I have feelings for you too? This whole thing is a setup between Xander and Kayla to humiliate you. Lucky for you, I arrived just in time to overhear Kayla talking to her friends about this dirty plan. Are you done talking? Do you really think I'd fall into their trap that easily? I already know their dirty tricks, and I was about to tell everyone what jerks they are. But then you showed up and ruined my plan. I don't care how clever and perfect your plan is. How long are you going to continue this tiring game of dispute? They think just because they're both hot that they can treat everyone else like they're puppets. Well, I've had enough. Evie, you're better than this. I don't like this revenge-seeking version of you. Can you please just stop it and go back to normal? Leo walked away in a huff and left me out here alone in the street. I stormed home and took off my makeup. Why was Leo so mad at me? I did nothing wrong. 
The gentle Leo I knew never had gotten mad or even went against my will, and was always the most enthusiastic supporter every time I imitated someone. What had gotten into him? I called him continuously, but Leo turned off the phone. Ugh. I felt so alone, it was horrible. Then I heard a knock on my door. Mom peered her head around it. Seeing me upset, she came over and cuddled me. It felt good having her comfort me, so I ended up blurting out everything to her. Hmm. It sounds like Leo was just worried about you. But as for Xander and Kayla, they're not worth your time or effort. Don't become someone you're not just to get revenge on people who don't deserve you. But... Suddenly, I heard rustling outside of my bedroom window. Then Leo poked his head through it. If you're not tired, then keep copying. You keep following me around like a pet. Go live your own real life. Mom and I both laughed along with him. Then I hugged Leo and told him I was sorry. It's true that pretending to be someone else is exhausting. And I must admit, I was wrong to use Kayla's name to sabotage her relationships. Tomorrow, I'll find her and apologize. Even though I don't want to. But I have to find a way to end this peacefully. Then, I can focus on just being me for a while. Without any of the drama. I'd only just arrived at school, yet I could tell something was up. Dude, what's with all the fuss? Did Carl do something crazy again? Look at this. Jeez, gross. Uh, sorry, wrong direction. This way. Here you go, Miss Stewart, the new principal of our school. In front of me was a stern-looking woman who exuded a terrifying aura. Ooh. Well, that was unexpected, as we all assumed that Mr. Smith would take the lead because he'd been serving as school vice principal for pretty much forever. Suddenly, everyone's phone vibrated. Why the stern face? She looks so angry at the world. Is she allergic to our skin? Every skirt is too short, lol. No dance party this year? Unbelievable! Is she a principal or a jailer? Ah, uh, warning you guys, she knows our secret smoking place. Jeez, look at all those faces pinned to their mobile phones. The gossip mongers. Over the next few days, rumors about our new principal seem to be everywhere. Info about her seemed more sought after than imagined dragon's tickets. Also, from day one of the principal's arrival here, a series of bizarre stories began to circulate. One day I was walking into class and heard the most ridiculous story in the world. My school was haunted. <laughs> Idiots. I quietly crept under the table, then suddenly poked my head up and shouted, Boo! Which caused all my friends to jump in fear. Ha <laughs> ha, losers. All that spook stuff is nonsense. You don't believe it, huh? Yet Stacy saw it. Oh no. Stacy? I didn't know they dragged my crush into all these silly gossip things. She's usually a smart girl. Not sure what had gotten into her. After that, Stacy lowered her voice and started talking passionately about her chance encounter with a silhouette that appeared in front of the principal's office. But worst of all, before she could get a closer look at it, it vanished. Um, it was probably just the security guard. Nah, when I left, I still saw him dozing off in his room. He even checked the camera and saw Stacy just standing and saying hello, even though nobody was there. <laughs> Creepy, right? Then the story went further when someone claimed that the new principal was a witch and was bringing evil forces to the school. Oh my God, Stacy, I needed to pull her out of this mess of nonsense right now. But no matter what I said, she insisted. I saw it with my own eyes. What if she really is capable of dark magic? Oh, come on. We're not kids anymore, Stace. Evil forces, witches, demons, they aren't real. But it's you who might get in trouble when the principal starts investigating who's spreading the rumor. Josh, it's driving me crazy. I need to confirm what I saw, but I'm scared. Can you come with me, please? I hesitated for a moment, then nodded. Okay, back gate, 10 p.m. tonight. Let's just get it over with. <laughs> Plus, it'd be a great chance to impress my crush, isn't it? That night, I arrived at our meeting point early and waited around. It was freezing, and not gonna lie, I got goosebumps. Okay, calm down, Josh. Ghosts were just tricks of the mind, and it's time to show my future girlfriend <laughs> how tough I am. As I was deep in my thoughts, a hand suddenly touched my shoulder. Jesus, Stacy! Do you know what time it is? Oh, sorry, I'm a bit late. D did I scare you? <laughs> of course not. Uh, let's get inside and end this obsession of yours. But uh, how are we supposed to get in? 
Stacy pointed at a big hole in the school's fence that was hidden by a bush. We then carefully sneaked through it and successfully avoided the security guard. <laughs> Piece of cake. Inside, the whole school corridor was pitch black, and the streetlight shone from the glass windows. The scenario looked pretty much like a horror movie, but there was nothing to fear, right? I used the flashlight to guide Stacy to the principal's office, when suddenly, a loud screech sound made my heart want to stop. Stacy clung to me in fear. Relax, I think it's just the sound of the speakers crackling. Are you scared, Stace? N no, le <laughs> let's just go. But then, as soon as the noise stopped, another creepy sound started up. Footsteps. Had the security guard spotted the two of us already? I turned around and there was nothing but an empty space. Just like that, we continued walking, and they walked too. And when we stopped, they stopped. Then, as soon as the footsteps began to rush towards us, I grabbed Stacy's hand and ran as fast as I could to the principal's office and slammed shut the door. Listen, Stacy, the footsteps were probably from the security guard. You see, it, clearly, we're the only ones here, so stop believing in these things, okay? I just finished talking when suddenly the door burst open and... And I could see a motionless figure standing there. That's him! Holy mother, I was so scared that I closed my eyes and grabbed onto Stacy. Then when I opened my eyes, the shadow was moving towards us. Terrified, I rushed to the door to escape and... Bang! Both me and the ghost fell. Mike, are you okay? Mike? The three of us sat awkwardly on the sidewalk outside the school. I didn't need the chilly wind to make my heart feel frozen. As it turned out, Stacy already had a boyfriend. And that boyfriend was none other than Mike, my best friend. Ugh, so much for me wasting my time playing hero. And if you're wondering why Mike was here, the answer was to help Stacy put on this phantom play. That's right. Both the crackling and the footstep sounds were all made by him. Hang on, why did she make up this ghost story thing? Even prepared a whole play for me and the others to acknowledge it? Stacy explained that it was only because the new principal was too harsh creating strict rules and making it difficult for the students. Huh? But I don't think any of these rules affect her much. I mean, Stacy had always been a model student anyway. So why did she have to take it to this extent? I asked, but Stacy just ignored me and asked me to keep it a secret. In the following days, people kept questioning me on my late-night expedition. At first, I just kept quiet because I didn't want to get involved in annoying gossip and to be reminded of how my best friend turned out to be my love rival. However, rumors about the haunted school spread quickly and reached the press. Fear swallowed the school. A few students even transferred to another one because they were so scared. Although I wasn't a fan of the new principal's strict rules, what Stacy did had gone too far. One day, I was about to find her to figure this out when I saw her walking alone down the exit stairs. Stacy, I know you're the principal's daughter and the admin of the spooky group chat that has been on the rise recently. What? Stacy's the principal's daughter? Unbelievable. And wasn't that person Mr. Smith, the vice principal? Perhaps we're after one same thing. Don't you want your mom to work elsewhere too, right? But your method doesn't seem to be working so well. So what do you suggest? There is an easier way, that is. Hand me your mother's seal. I will take care of this. That's too dangerous. How can I trust you? Now that we're on the same boat, you probably don't want your mother to know what you've done behind your back, do you? As soon as Mr. Smith left, I immediately ran to Stacy. No, you can't do that. You don't even know him personally. Be careful. But Stacy insisted on doing it on her own. She said that since her father passed away, she'd grown tired of her mother's rules. School was the only place she used to feel free. But now, that also been ruined for her. I can't live 24-7 under my mother's containment. Do you understand? Well, it's true that being a teacher's child must be stressful enough already. Not to mention being the child of a strict principal. That would surely be even more exhausting. But conspiring with Mr. Smith was a step too far, right? And what will be, will be. A few days later, a ton of messages regarding the principal faking test scores to improve the school's ranking broke out. And of course, she would be subject to disciplinary procedures and may have to quit her job forever for violating professional ethics. I looked over at Stacy. Her face darkened and suddenly she darted out of the classroom. I chased after her and looked everywhere for her, but she was nowhere to be found until I heard a sobbing sound coming from the abandoned canteen. Thank goodness, there she was. Seeing me, Stacy burst into tears and poured her heart out. 
She could not have foreseen the consequences of her actions and naively let Mr. Smith take advantage of her and created all this. Stace, I think it's best to tell your mom the truth. There's still time to fix this, quick, before it's too late. She wiped her tears and gave me a hug, then agreed to go find her mom. Mom, I... I'm sorry, I started the rumors and I conspired with Mr. Smith to help ruin your career. I thought the principal was going to go ballistic, but then to my surprise, she came forward and pulled Stacy into her arms. I know things have been tough since your father was no longer with us. I've just been so worried about you making the wrong choices and going down the wrong path that I started to be stricter on you. I love you. I never meant to put this much pressure on you. I'm sorry. Please forgive Stacy. She never meant to hurt you, and she feels terrible about it. Everything's fine. Thank you very much, Josh, for telling me about this. Huh? You already know everything? <laughs> yeah. I was so worried that you would be taken advantage of, so I told her about the conversation you had with the vice principal. As for the rumor that the principal had to quit her job, it was me who spread it. I mean, that's how Stacy realized what she did was outrageous and could have big consequences, right? <laughs> Although her mom forgave her, Stacy was still nervous because she'd given Mr. Smith her mother's seal. It's okay, dear. What you did accidentally helped me to get evidence of his embezzlement by impersonating me. His misconduct will soon be handled. It's all good now. My work here was done. I fixed things with Stacy and her mom. But most importantly of all, I proved that the school's not haunted. <laughs> so, what's next? Well, Stacy must have been so moved by my heroic actions and started developing feelings for me. As she broke up with Mike, not long after that, then asked me out. But he's my best friend, and there's no way I'm making him sad over a girl, so I turned her down. Besides, her mischievous side is kind of terrifying. Girls are dangerous. <laughs> this view of the Alps is magnificent. Wow, I've never felt this free before. <sighs> huh? Hang on, are those... Meowing sounds that I'm hearing? I followed the sounds to the raging river nearby, and there, stuck on a rock in the middle of it, was a terrified cat. Oh no, poor baby, I've got to help it. I quickly grabbed onto the nearby tree, then leaned out towards the rock with an opened umbrella on the other hand for the cat to jump onto. The cat hesitated for a bit, before making the leap. But it's heavier than I expected. I lost my balance and tumbled into the river. I grabbed the cat just in time, but the strong current made it impossible to float. In a panic, I screamed for help, but the waves lapped over me, and gulps of water filled my mouth. And just like that, I felt my surroundings darken. Ugh, what was this wet, scratchy thing rubbing on my face? I opened my eyes to see that cat sitting on me. Thank goodness it was okay, but where am I? This seemed like some kind of rustic cottage house? Suddenly, a man walked into the room with a food tray. H who are you? Relax, I'm the one who jumped into the river to rescue you both. Turns out, he happened to pass by the river while we were swallowed by the current, and he didn't hesitate to jump in to save us, then brought us back to his home. Oh, um, thank you. For everything. Sure, here, eat up. So, how come you and Topaz fell into the waterway? Who? Oh, you mean the cat? How come you know his name? It says it right here. See? I'm guessing this is not your cat, then? I told him how I accidentally found Topaz, so its family must live around here somewhere. Hearing this, he agreed to help me find Topaz's owner the next day. He even gave me his bed for the night, then walked out saying he'd sleep on the couch. But as a guest, I couldn't let him do that, so I just grabbed the blanket and went to sit next to him. You have a cool tattoo there. Kinda looks like a mini Mars, right? Nah, it's my birthmark. The only thing my parents left me. Hans then told me that he grew up not having a clue who his parents were or why they abandoned him. At 18, he moved out of his foster home and came here to become an herbalist. <sighs> I felt so bad for him, and in a way, I could relate. Being alone is difficult, but having both mom and dad won't guarantee your happiness. I was born into a well-off family with both of my parents, but the thing was, they only got together due to an arranged marriage, and they have resented each other ever since. My house always felt so cold and empty, and I hated staying there. So, as soon as I graduated high school, I took a gap year to travel the world. Actually, Switzerland is my first stop. Gotta say, 
It's nice to have someone to talk to like this. I guess Hans felt the same way by this look he gave me. He seemed very touched. The next morning, we took Topaz to the town to ask around. Turned out, today was their annual festival, so a horde of people crammed along the street to celebrate and watch the parade. Hans held my hand so I didn't get lost, but somehow the crowd still pulled me away and I ended up stuck among these sweaty people. Suddenly, a hand grabbed mine and led me out of there. Phew, thank God, I couldn't breathe in there. And you know what? A super handsome, stylish guy was standing in front of me. Are you okay? That's when I noticed the tail of my shirt was ripped. Freaked out, I tried to cover it up, so he took out a silk scarf and tied it around my waist. For a second there, I froze to the spot, so amazed by his thoughtfulness. Just at that moment, my phone buzzed with a call from Hans. He told me to meet him at the fountain. Um, slight problem? I had no idea where that was. Well, lucky me, this gallant guy offered to take me there. We talked along the way, and I found out his name's Willard. He lives in a nearby town and was here for the festival. I told him I came to find the owner of the lost cat I'd found. Then, when I showed him the picture of Topaz, he couldn't hide his shock. Are you sure this is the cat you found? I nodded. He stayed silent for a while, then said, I might know its owner, but I gotta go now. Bring the cat to meet me there. Faye, it was nice meeting you. Then he bowed down to kiss the back of my hand before he left. How sweet. I watched as he disappeared into the crowd. Thanks to Topaz, I got the chance to meet him again. Uh, why are you making that funny face? I told him about my encounter with Willard and convinced him to come with me to the address on the handkerchief. He seemed skeptical at first, but then gave in. I mean, other than this, we had no clue. It was worth a shot, right? The next day, we went to the place Willard told us. But, seriously? Is this right? Why were there a line of people all holding near-on identical cats to Topaz? They even had the same collar as him. What is going on? I walked over to ask an old man sitting on a bench. He told me the millionaire lady who lives here had lost her dearest cat, Topaz. People said his name was on the top of her inheritance list, and she promised to greatly reward anyone who safely returned him, so these frauds were trying to deceive the owner by bringing some topaz look-alike here. But Madame Primrose is no fool. Huh? Madame Primrose? The iconic designer and president of Wisteria Fashion Corp? That's right. Oh my god! I immediately dragged Hans to stand in the line. You see, my childhood dream was to become a fashion designer, and, of course, the one I admired the most was none other than Madame Primrose! Ah! One of the reasons I came to Switzerland was to find her and hopefully become her apprentice. And now look, what are the odds? Finally, it was our turn, but... I'm gonna have to stop you right there. All right, everyone, listen up. Madame Primrose won't accept any toe passes from now on, as she's tired of your deceit. So, disperse. What? We didn't just wait half a day here for nothing. Fine, I'll find another way to get in. We then walked around the mansion and found its side gate. Then, just when we were climbing over it, a maid caught us. But she didn't make a fuss out of it. Instead, she seemed a bit flirty towards Hans. Ooh, I had an idea. There's our chance. You go and charm her. He seemed confused at first, but then got the point. Hey, I think you're really cute. Hans then tried his best at flirting, and as soon as she swooned, I asked her to help us return Topaz to his owner. The maid hesitated at first, but when we said that we didn't need to be repaid or anything, she agreed to let us in. We quickly split up to find Madame Primrose. I wandered the maze-like hallways. Then I suddenly bumped into someone. Mind your way! Wait, I don't know you. What are you doing here? I, uh, um... She's my new friend. Is there a problem? I'm sorry, young master. It was Willard. He came to rescue me again. Great to see you again, young master Willard. You live here? Why didn't you call me when you arrived? Did you bring the cat? Where is it? Give it to me right now. Willard, calm down. Topaz is safe. I just found out his owner is Madame Primrose and- I'm her grandson. Just give the cat to me now. His agitated behavior didn't seem right. I took a few steps back from him, refused to do what he said, then ran. You don't understand. Just at that moment, Hans and Madame Primrose appeared.
There you are. Are you okay? He worriedly asked. But boy, all I could see right now was Madame Primrose. She approached me, held my hand, and repeatedly thanked me for risking my life to rescue Topaz. This was amazing, but... Hmm, but why did Willard just leave without saying anything? Madame Primrose invited us to stay for dinner that evening. Joining us were Willard and his mom, Agnetta. Madame then told me how much Topaz meant to her. Twenty years ago, she lost her son, Mr. Alvarez, to a car accident. Then, a year later, her grandson Leroy disappeared. Her grief was almost unbearable, but then she was gifted a cat, Topaz, and, thanks to him, she began to heal. I tried comforting her by saying she still had Willard, her other amazing grandson with an excellent fashion sense inherited from his grandma. But, to my surprise, Madame Primrose said Willard isn't her real grandson, since Agnetta is actually Mr. Alvarez's second wife and was a stepmom to the missing grandson, Leroy and Willard was her son with her ex-husband. I could see Willard and his mom were feeling so uncomfortable. Willard must have felt so hurt as Madame Primrose never even thought of him as a family member. Then my train of thought was interrupted by Hans. Ugh, why didn't he just tell me to pass him the salt instead of sticking his right arm to my face like this? Suddenly, Agnetta gave him a mortified look and spilled wine all over the table. Mom, are you okay? She didn't reply, but just left. I could tell it was because she saw Hans's birthmark. What could this be? Has she no manners? She must be unwell. I'll go check on her. So I followed her to the garden gazebo. That's where I heard her talking to someone on the phone. You had one simple job. Take that pampered moggy miles away. Well, guess what? It came back. I gasped in shock, and right then, a hand covered my mouth. Shh. Be quiet. Oh, but it gets worse. The stupid cat brought Leroy, the missing grandson, home. That's right. I saw that Mars birthmark with my own eyes. If Primrose finds out about this, we're done. You hear me? Wait, so Leroy, Madame Primrose's only grandchild, is actually Hans. Uh, and his stepmom was the one who secretly gave him away in the first place. Even worse, I was hearing the shocking news with her son. Willard, get it together. Do you know anything about her plan? I knew Mom was behind Topaz going missing. That's why I tried to take the cat away earlier, to keep him safe from her. But, but Leroy, too? That was just heartless. What should I do now? She's my mom, after all. I could see his pure and kind soul being tormented, and my heart ached for him. I know it must be hard, but you need to tell Madame Primrose the truth and make things right. That's a way to help your mom redeem herself, okay? He stared at me with those dreamy eyes of his, and I felt my heart turn to mush. But a phone call from Hans interrupted us. He was looking for me, saying we gotta go. Right, I had to tell him the truth. In a cab back to Hans's cottage, I told him everything, and he just burst out laughing, saying, <laughs> I'm Leroy, the heir of a millionaire. Oh, please. <laughs> I'm serious. You were brought to the foster home exactly 19 years ago, and you both have this one-of-a-kind birthmark. Okay, so what if I'm really her grandson? I don't even know her, and I'm definitely not rich kid material. You've been lonely your entire life. This is your chance to find the family you've always wanted. Hans was speechless. It seemed I'd hit his weak spot, and he finally agreed. We asked the driver to take us back to the mansion. But no one was awake at that hour except a gardener. He led us to a library deep into the mansion, brought out tea, and told us to wait. Just a few minutes later, Hans started coughing, and his face swelled up. Oh no, he must have been allergic to something in the tea. Panicked, I screamed for help, and the gardener came back and carried Hans to the car. But then, a hand muzzled me from behind, and everything went dark. I woke up with my head pounding and unable to move. As I tried to make sense of the situation, I realized I was tied to a chair, mouth taped, surrounded by some rusty, unsanitary medical tools. And on the other side of the room, Hans was unconscious and tied to a patient's bed. Standing next to him was Agnetta and the gardener and a guy in a blouse with some kinds of tools in his hand, about to do something to Hans's birthmark. I tried to scream and struggled to break free, but I couldn't move an inch. Right at that moment, Willard barged in. Stop this. Leave right now or I'll call the cops for your unlicensed business. And mom, I already know everything, so please have some remorse. Agnetta looked so ashamed of herself. 
Willard, everything I did, I did it for you. Please understand. You saw how that old hag Primrose treated me. I was so miserable. Then your dad offered to help me. Dad? You mean Tim? How can he be my dad? Don't be such a wimp, son. I stayed and worked here like a servant just to be close to you. We did all this so you can be the only heir. You deserve that. Now, finish it. I... I can't, Tim. Get away from my mom, you dirtbag. You never cared about me. You only moved here to manipulate her to do your dirty work. A terrible person like you will never be my dad. Then I'll do it. As he was about to lay hands on Hans, suddenly there was a meowing sound and Topaz appeared, followed by Madame Primrose. Step away from my grandson. You dared to live under my roof all this time and play foul tricks on my family? Take him away. Luckily, Hans came round, and he had a tearful reunion with his grandma. They finally had the closure they deserved. Hans decided to stay in the mansion with his long-lost family. He's even planted an herbal garden there for treating and healing people, as he always wished. Madame Primrose had finally found peace, as now she had both her beloved grandson and precious cat back. She also thought that maybe she'd been too strict on Agneta, so she decided not to press any charges against her. Agneta had also apologized, but she felt too full of shame to stay and decided to move out of the mansion. Willard followed his mom and helped her start a new life. What about me? Well, I got the thing I've always dreamt of, to be Madame Primrose's apprentice. That's her gift to me for bringing both her cat and her grandson back. And, right now, I'm late for a date with a very special guy. Can you guess who it is? Wow, this Florida Beach Resort was the epitome of luxury. Hi, I'm Dakota, the beloved and only daughter of Hardy Balmer, the world-renowned wine billionaire. <sighs> but I don't know why. We have this huge fortune, and Dad still makes me study and always rushes me to get a job. Well, no way that's gonna happen. So for now, let's just enjoy this gorgeous place and this finest wine, shall we? FYI, there isn't a wine brand in the world I haven't tasted. I can distinguish them all easily with just one sip. Chardonnay versus Riesling? <laughs> Piece of cake. Hmm, let's see if there's anything interesting going on in the world. Wait, wh what is this? There must be some mistake. How, how can Daddy be bankrupt? I called him repeatedly, but all I got was the busy signal. Something's wrong. I rushed to the private helicopter to return to our mansion. What's happening? Why are those men carrying away our valuable furniture? The nanny Maria ran out to me in tears. She told me daddy had disappeared and all he'd left behind was this wooden box. I rummaged through it but only found some old notebooks and a certificate of ownership for a farm winery. Oh well, dad may be bankrupt but at least I still have this vineyard to live off. Let's go check out my newly acquired assets then. This place looks huge. I wonder how much money it made a month. I looked around and then wandered into an enormous wine cellar. Curious, I touched some wine barrels when suddenly someone's voice snapped at me. Stay away from them. Who are you? <laughs> I'll have you know that I own this place, so I'll do whatever I want. Have you lost your mind? Get out. Now. He suddenly grabbed my wrist and dragged me outside. I furiously screamed and people started to gather around. Listen up. My name is Dakota, Hardy Balmer's daughter, and from now on, I'm in charge around here. I showed them the certificate of ownership as proof, but they didn't seem to care. Only an old-looking man came to shake my hand. Welcome, Miss Balmer. I'm Jack, your father's long-standing companion. Come inside. My son James will show you around in a bit. Okay, finally, someone showed some manners. Oh, I miss hanging out with my friends. I should have been at Fashion Week right now, not here in this lousy <sighs> farm. Get up, couch potato. You have a vineyard to visit. Ugh, it's that rude guy again. It's too hot outside now. No way I'm making my way out there. So I shoot him away and continued staring at my phone. James then threw the stupid map of the winery at me and left. Thank God, he finally left me alone. After a week of lounging around and being waited on by Nanny Maria, I eventually longed for fresh air. Remembering the map James gave me, I decided to check out the place. First stop, the vineyard. Wow, it's so big! But why did they leave the soil so crackling dry? Let's see, where's the sprinkler? Ha! Huh. 
There we go. But as soon as I turn it on, a scowling farmer ran over and immediately turned it off. Hey, miss. This is not your toy. What's the attitude? They're my employees but have the cheek to act this snootily to me? Harvest this in two weeks. To keep the sweetness of the grapes, no one waters them. Why is this James guy everywhere? I'm the daughter of the wine billionaire. I didn't need any preaching on how to run my farm. Days after that, I came to the farm to pluck up the grass, trim, and fertilize the plants. But I kept getting shooed out. Those awful farmers were so disrespectful. Fine. I needed to show them who's the real boss here. That night, I asked Zach to gather everyone in the communal dining room and declared I would fire some of them for their disrespectful attitudes. But they just gave indifferent looks. How dare they? Didn't they know I could just sell this place and make them all homeless? But then Jack handed me a contract signed by my daddy, stating that due to the blood, sweat, and tears they'd all put into this place, no one has the right to fire them or sell the farm. Jack also gave me other documents. Seemed like due to my family's bankruptcy, the farm had not been doing well. If nothing changes, it might be dissolved. What? So the only property Dad left me was also on the verge of failing? I yelled at them. Then do something to sort it out, now! Suddenly, everyone got up from their seats and glared at me with anger. My head was spinning around. Feeling panicked, I rushed outside. I sat by myself, hugging the wooden box Daddy left me in bewilderment. I flipped the notebooks and was surprised to find a letter in the bottom of the box in which Dad told all about how from the day Mom passed away, he'd put all the effort into this farm and became a successful entrepreneur. I used to believe that compensating my time for work to provide you with a wealthy life would be enough. All this actually did was create a greater distance between us. My darling Dakota, I'm so sorry. My only hope is that you'll see as much beauty in this vineyard as I do. If only Dad was here now, how can I deal with all these troubles and challenges ahead? I burst into tears. They meant no harm. James' voice startled me. I quickly wiped away my tears. He sat beside me and offered a wine-spludged handkerchief. This isn't just some random form for these people. It's also their home. Don't accuse them of not trying. This farm means far more to them than it does to you. I... I was just... This is when we should all stand together. Don't let your selfishness threaten the future of this whole winery and everyone involved. Even though I hated his guts, what he said did make sense. Maybe I had been neglectful of my responsibility for this place. If this winery was the most precious thing to my dad, then I want to put it right for him. James smiled gently, putting his hand on my shoulder. That's settled then. We're all gonna revive this place. He then left after telling me to show up at the cellar at 5 a.m. the day after. The next morning, while walking around, James told me everything about temperature control and wine brewing. Growing up, Dad would always pass on this wine knowledge to me at the dinner table, and I actually remembered them. He even took me to his wine tasting sessions, and that's how he discovered I was gifted with a great sense of smell and taste buds. Even James was impressed with my talent and said I was born to work in this industry after letting me taste some samples. The next step in the process was much harder than I thought. It took me a whole day to memorize all the different varieties of grapes and how to sort them, but I still messed it up. How come there are so many ripe stages? I was frustrated and was about to leave when Karen, my instructor, called me back. You have to take it slow. Wine takes time and we have to be patient. Okay, fine, I'll try. As I was sorting, I got to chat with the workers, and it turned out they were quite friendly and even helped me out a lot. It was true that these workers really treated this place like their home and cherished it here. It had been more than two weeks, and I was harvesting the new crop with everyone. Thanks to the tips in Dad's notebook, with a pinch of my own creativity to it, James and I were in the process of creating a new line of wine. I was confident that this would help revive the winery. I was checking stuff in the cellar when James rushed in with a leaflet in his hand. Hey Dakota, this is our chance. Wow, so this town was hosting an upcoming wine festival. If our winery could win something, we could gain lots of orders for this season. The next morning, I prepared all the documents to register for the King of Wine contest. While waiting for the interview, I strolled through the showroom and tasted the previous winning wines. Wow, they all have unique tastes. 
Since I had my eyes closed to appreciate the wine layers, I bumped into a handsome guy and accidentally spilled red wine on his shirt. Oh, I'm... I'm sorry. No biggie. It's just a small stain. Oh my. He was such a gentleman, which made me feel even more guilty. I was about to ask for his contact so I could make it up for him later when the organizer called me for the interview. My eyes were just looking away from him for a sec and he'd already gone. Anyway, it was a blessing the interview went well and our winery was eligible for the contest. I decided to treat myself to a coffee before heading back. But at the counter, I realized I didn't have any money on me. Oh no. I... I forgot my wallet. I'll pay for that. Wait, it's him. The guy I spilled the wine on. Turns out, he's Danny. And he might be young, but he's in fact a skilled wine critic who even held the position of vice president of the city's wine association. More surprisingly, he's a fan of my dad's and adores the wines he created. After chatting with him, I came back to the farm to tell everyone the good news. They were all very excited and started preparing for the competition right away. Two weeks before the competition, the organizing committee sent over a few people to do some preliminary assessments. And guess what? Danny was also here, being a part of the inspection team. So after the inspection, I invited Danny to stay and share some knowledge about wine brewing. And fortunately, he's free for a few days and was pleased to stick around. Yay! I excitedly told James the great news, but he responded with no interest. That's not exactly good news. Hmm, why? Oh, I see. You're jealous of him, aren't you? What? Me? Jealous? What does he even have for me to be envious about? Well, he's handsome and also exceedingly knowledgeable about wine. And people seem to like him. Wait, where are you going? I haven't finished. Whatever. No one needs him, as we have Danny here now. Such a charming gentleman. <sighs> for the next two days, Danny kept trying to make time for me. Yes, just the two of us. Gosh, he's so romantic. I could spend hours with him. Dakota, you're the most special girl I've ever met. Hey, dinner time. Ugh, another would-be perfect moment ruined by James. He seemed to go out of his way to come between us. He sat in between us in the dining room, saying it was his favorite seat. Then, he followed us into the vineyard and said he was checking the quality of the grapes at 11 p.m. For real? Such a third wheel, and he's so cranky toward Danny. Hello, the guy's trying to help us here, so why the grumpy attitude? Later that night, I was passing by the kitchen when I overheard James and his dad. Should we start now? Definitely. The big day is coming up, or else we won't make it. Dakota is busy being all lovey-dovey with that jerk. She doesn't need to know this. What? Are they planning something behind my back? And then, something absolutely horrible happened the next day. When Danny and I arrived at the cellar to pick up the competition wine, we stepped into a sauna. What is this? Why is the wine cellar so hot? Someone must have tampered with the room temperature. I rushed to check the wine. Oh no, the heat had removed the last two notes and made it too sour. I fell to the ground and started sobbing. Danny tried to comfort me. He told me not to worry as he'd introduced some big clients to me. Then he had to leave to prepare for the upcoming competition. I looked at the barrels in sorrow, but then remembered something. My dad also set the heat too high once and found a way to filter and ferment it again to tone down the sour flavor. I'm sure it's somewhere in the notes he left. I hurried back to my room to search through the wooden box, but I couldn't find it anywhere. Someone definitely was messing with me. Oh my god, who else could it be? The conversation between James and his dad came to mind, so I furiously went to look for him. Seeing James, I couldn't control my anger and shouted, It's you, isn't it? You adjusted the wine cellar temperature. You stole my father's notebook. You've been planning to sabotage me for a long time, haven't you? James acted confused, but before the snake could blurt out anything, I stopped him and said, Get out of here! Now! He gave a defeated nod, then left without a word. Tomorrow is the day of the contest, yet I don't have any wine to enter. I picked up the letter my father left me and felt like a loser. Maybe I'm just not fit for this. Right at this moment, James pushed the door open. Dakota, look! I told you to leave! Ignoring my words, James calmly poured a glass of wine and told me to try it. Oh, this actually tastes pretty good. 
It's the new one you created. I stayed up a few nights and fixed its acrid taste. Now we can take it to the contest. I yelped out in joy, then lunged to hug a surprised-looking James. Look at his face, red as a tomato. <laughs> but remembering how sketchy he was in the kitchen the other night, I quickly let go of him and calmed down. First things first, we had to hit the road now to participate in the competition. Our wine stall attracted a lot of guests and got highly praised by all the judges. When Danny saw us, I noticed how surprised he seemed by my presence with this new wine. I didn't expect the technique of filtration and fermentation could change the flavor so amazingly. You're really talented, Dakota. Let's take some time to discuss this in more detail later. I happily agreed, but isn't that technique recorded in my dad's notebook? How did he know it? I left the bar and sneakily followed Danny. Then, in a hidden corner, I overheard him talking to someone. I've adjusted the cellar's heat to destroy everything, but who knew she'd use her father's technique to fix it? I've already taken the notebook away, but she probably remembered them all. Whatever the reason is, her wine is becoming a strong rival. The championship is at stake. Can you just do something? So, have I been trusting the wrong person? Well, that hurts. But I'll sure make him pay for that. I quickly submitted the recording to the judges, and immediately there was an announcement to pause, and the wines were regraded by blind tasting. To be fair, and you know what? The new wine I created won the third prize. Okay, so the prize money wasn't as grand, but it'd help us get a decent amount of orders for the next year's crop. I happily went to the podium to accept the award, and almost fainted on stage because the awarder was no one other than my dad. I hugged him and sobbed uncontrollably. It turned out that my father was not bankrupt. He just donated all his assets to charity. His plan to pretend bankruptcy was just to help me become more independent and walk on my own feet. It's unbelievable, but I'm not mad at him for it. On the contrary, I feel very fortunate that my father did that to give me a chance to grow up. As for Danny, he was kicked out of the City Wine Association. <laughs> That's the price to pay for his caddishness. He deserves it. And James, it turns out that the conversation between him and his father was just about fixing the wine, as the two of them discovered the spoiled wine way before I did. Now the vineyard is my first career, just like it was my dad's. This place is my home, and the workers are my family. Yep, this even includes this cold, cranky guy. Hi there, I'm Anita, a science pro and robotics prodigy. I've won countless trophies, including one for making a talking replica of BB-8. But it's my crush's heart that I can't win. Tom has just refused to accompany me to the last middle school dance. But who cares? I've got my bestie Barb. It'll still be fun. We can go together. We arrived at the dance to find that everyone had dates except for us. Well, this is a little awkward. Move. This is a dance floor, Grannies. Either you dance or get out. Bet this is the first party you've ever got to attend. As if Tom would go out with such a loser. Yeah, you should try asking your robots out instead. As they walked off laughing, I felt so disheartened. Barb told me not to listen to them, but their words niggled away at me. I realized if I didn't change, then I'd waste the rest of my teen years by being a loser that got left out of all the fun. I needed to reinvent myself now before it was too late. Over the summer break, I thought it over and realized that there was only one way forward. I should flip the script, where nobody knew who I was, and this is the perfect occasion for that. High school. I purposely chose a school that's across the city. It's a bit inconvenient, but that's how to be sure I'd not run into anyone from my local middle school. Of course, except for Barb. She's going there with me also. Hey, recognize me? I'm still Anita. Like my new look? I've had a style update, ditched my glasses, and all the uncool geeky stuff. Ooh, let's surprise my bestie. <laughs> Anita? Whoa! Talk about a Captain Marvel transformation. Gee, thanks. This hair color is so in season right now. Hang on, you look just like Chelsea. Oh, do I? How funny! You sound like her too. Okay, so Chelsea was this popular girl from middle school. Um, yeah, I may have spent all summer studying her. All right, I actually mirrored her style and mannerisms. I'm just learning to better myself. This isn't any different from using humans as models when programming a robot. Besides, it's not like Chelsea's here to mind. Speaking of robots, how's your BB-8? No, that's my past. We'll never be cool and get boyfriends if our peers think we're nerds. Come with me after school. I'll give you a makeover too. It's okay, Anita. I don't mind being a nerd. But if this makes you happy, then you have my full support. My sweet naive Barb has no idea how incredible being cool would be. They are the cool kids here, aka celebrities.
They're so dazzling and popular. And oh my god, who's that? He's so dreamy. So I confidently strutted over to introduce myself to the whole group when... <sighs> Luckily, no one seemed to notice my fall, or they just didn't care. <sighs> Anyways, this was only my first day here. I had loads of time to fit in with the celebrities. And then catch that hottie, who supposedly named Eric's attention. At first, the popular girls didn't notice me, but then a few days in, Lou, the celebrity's leader, had a lipstick emergency and I sprung to her rescue. See? I told you, this burgundy shade really pops against your cool undertone. Ruby Woo? That's so 2015, Ashley. You can put that away. And easy peasy, I became part of the group. They invited me to their parties, shopping trips, and spa days. It's like entering a completely new world. An extra shiny one. I got to sit with them at lunch where they ubered low-calorie food. Normally, I had the same as them, but today my mom packed me a special sandwich with the moist maker, just like Ross's from Friends. Sorry, guys, but Anita doesn't share food! <laughs> Are you seriously going to drink that? You can practically see the fat and lactose swirling in it. Gross! Oh, okay. Looks like the moist maker would have to wait. I looked around and saw Barb sharing her mom's amazeballs mac and cheese with her new geeky friends. I've not spoken to Barb properly in weeks. We kept trying to reschedule as I had manicures with Lou, Haley's party, and all these ever after school shopping trips. Which kept getting so expensive. Aren't you gonna buy that? You haven't bought anything. Um, that's because I only wear tailor-made clothes made of Egyptian cotton or at least silk linen. Um, okay. In that case, you can be our assistant. Make sure you wear a cute cardigan tomorrow for a OOTD Instagram post. Ashley has made a list of the available colors. That's why I had to use all of my allowance on this cardigan. But it's fine. That's just how popular clicks have to be. And it's so nice of them to let me hang around. I proudly strutted alongside the celebs, looking just like one of them. Other students gawped at us, and it sure felt good. But suddenly, this dizzy spell came over me. I started shaking and feeling cold. Then, pitch black. I woke up in the infirmary to Barb's worried face. Oh good, you're awake. It's no surprise you passed out. You aren't eating enough. What? I'm eating just fine. Besides, skinny is chic. I'm not arguing with you. You're lucky your head didn't hit the floor thanks to Eric. Eric saved me? He must have caught me like in a romantic movie. This diet is amazing. I wouldn't have been in Eric's arms without it. Later, I tried to thank him, but he put his headphones on and walked off. And I never saw him at any of the celebs' parties or anything. A hot guy like him is probably hanging out with an even cooler clique and interested in even more popular girls. I need to try harder. But my geeky side wasn't going to stay suppressed. One time, this guy slated Spider-Man 2099, my favorite character ever. Dude doesn't understand how the multiverse works, and his suit sucks. Are you kidding me? As if you know how it works, his suit incorporates Parker tech and has stealth features and exploding spider saucers. Okay, cool it, new girl. It's just some weirdo jumps around in spandex. Right, be cool. Cool kids didn't geek out over superheroes. Luckily, everyone else seemed distracted. I turned to look and saw them already flocked around some new kid with a huge backpack, a comic t-shirt, and jeans. Huh, it's like looking at middle school me. When I managed to get a closer look, I almost fell over in shock. It was Chelsea! Why would pretty popular Chelsea do a total 180 on her looks? I tried to avoid Chelsea, but then one time when I was trying to approach Eric, she appeared and he actually spoke to her. Does Chelsea know Eric? Since when? How come? Ah! Time stopped as I stared into his big dreamy eyes, but falling for each other again? <laughs> he might as well just stay in his arms. I quickly walked away and passed Chelsea. Our eyes met. Did she recognize me? She didn't say anything, but was that a smirk I saw? I needed to find out if Chelsea really recognized me, so I turned to Barb. It was a bit awkward, as we hadn't spoken in a while. But luckily, Barb was cool about it and said she'd try to find out. We chatted a bit, and then she asked me, We are still going to Comic-Con on the 7th, right? Yeah, of course. Can't wait. I was excited about Comic-Con until... A few days later, the celebrities had a big announcement. They were attending Conan Gray's concert on the 7th. Are you coming, or do you have some tragic nerdy convention to go to? Huh? That's oddly specific. I panicked and said yes to the concert. We had to give money to Asher the next day, and she would take care of purchasing everyone's tickets. But thanks to that overpriced cardigan, how am I supposed to afford this? Hmm, I guess there was one way to pay for it. Me and Barb's Comic-Con fund, which we'd been saving since middle school. I was only borrowing and would definitely pay it back. 
The following day, the celebs gathered to discuss the concert. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a flustered-looking Barb. What about our plan? Did you just spend all your savings on some concert you don't even care about? I'm sorry, I promise I'll pay you back. I just needed some time. So, you spent my share too? How could you? I felt terrible. I never meant to upset my friend like that. I just really wanted to fit in. Only, after that day, I found myself miserable with the celebs. The more time I spent with them, the more things about them got me second-guessing this group's dynamic. For instance, they talked a lot about the importance of being eco-friendly, but ordered Uber Eats almost every day, and constantly brought new, cute, reusable straws in Stanley Cups. Moreover, it was always lose weight or the highway, and they even trash-talked their own group members behind their backs. I found myself often looking around for Barb and then feeling extra guilty. On my way home, I was dragging my feet, feeling awful, when I passed an appliance store. I saw some students from my school's robotics team struggling with their droid, so I gladly offered a hand. If you want my lunch money, take it, but please leave Gears Brosnan alone. We worked hard on it. I tried explaining that I just wanted to help, but they kept pushing me away. I stared down at myself and realized that I wasn't welcomed because I'd given up everything to look like a celebrity. However, I didn't feel like one. I'd stood by and let the celebs push everyone else around. Was this really the life I wanted? That weekend was supposed to be spa day with the celebs, so I went out to the mall to ask Lou for my concert ticket. I was going to sell it and pay Barb back. Only when I got there, I saw Chelsea with them, but she looked like her cool self again. Uh-oh, I better go. But too late, Chelsea caught me and told everyone. Guys, look who's here. Fun fact, Anita and I used to be friends back in middle school. Cover yourself in foundation all you want, but your nerdiness will still show. Everyone started laughing, and that's when it dawned on me. They were all in on Chelsea's plans to expose me. I wanted to leave, but I still needed my ticket back. Sure, you can have it back, but on one condition. Wash off your Chelsea disguise and go back to being pathetic little you again. And so they told me to wash my hair in this decorative basin in a lush store before everyone's confused eyes and their live streaming cameras. I swallowed my pride and did it for Barb. But afterward, Lou turned back on her word. Actually, I gave it to Chelsea. Tough luck. Oops, too bad I never agreed to the deal Lou made with you. I felt overcome with panic and shame. I ran and I bumped into someone. Eric! Seeing how upset I was, he took me for coffee and a chat. As soon as we sat down, I burst into tears and told him how I'd lost everything. My popularity, dignity, friends. It all started to fall apart when Chelsea turned up all of a sudden, and then the domino effect took over. Chelsea? I'd always known she's catty, but I never thought she'd go that far. How can you be friends with her? <laughs> what? No, it's not what you think. You still don't recognize me? What do you mean, recognize? Then he revealed that he was from my middle school. I was shooketh! But if I squinted real hard, I guess he did look vaguely familiar. Whoa, puberty hit you like a truck. Same for you. Yeah, no, it wasn't puberty for me. I got emotionally scarred from being an outcast and became afraid of missing out on cool stuff, so I turned myself into a Chelsea clone to be popular. That's insane. But if it means anything, I prefer the old you. It's great seeing you at the school. But when I saw that you changed and joined the celebs, I was kind of apprehensive. But for real, though, I would have died for you to notice me. I was beyond surprised. He liked me all along? Suddenly, Chelsea jumped in. Why has it always been her? I changed myself to look like her. Didn't you say you liked nerdy girls? So why not me? Say what? Chelsea liked Eric? So she really copied my look. And for that reason? I'm sorry, Chelsea, but it's my feelings. I can't believe you rejected me twice for this little nerd, and she doesn't even look like herself anymore. Chelsea, it's never been about looks. It's about who she is. In the midst of it, I finally understood something. I was fine just being me. I never needed to be anything else. I've switched schools and turned myself into a dork for you! Ah! You're lucky this time! I watched Chelsea stomp out. I realized how I was constantly anxious and on edge that I'd messed up while hanging out with the celebrities. I missed the truly happy moments with real friends where I could just be me. All this time, I thought I'd been missing out on all the fun, but turns out, I missed nothing. The true way to have beautiful teenage years is to spend it with people that really appreciate you and do the things that you actually enjoy. I thanked Eric, then left. There was something important I needed to do first. I went home and fixed my BB-8, then took it over to Barb's house. Sorry, Barb. I'm so sorry, Barb. I was so desperate to be cool that I overlooked what really mattered. I miss you and our friendship so much. 
I missed you too, and I saw that humiliating video, and just wanted to know you were okay. On second thoughts, I'll forgive you if you give me your BB-8. <laughs> no can do, as I'm selling it online to make money to pay you back. I only brought it here to make my apology more meaningful. Did it work? We both hug. The next few days at school, I tried my best to fix things. I returned to my old image, well, with a slight upgrade. I can't let my beauty skills go to waste now. And I dug out all my geeky stuff. I showed up at the robotics club, and this time, I confidently strode over and immediately fixed their robot. I told you I could help. Don't judge a book by its cover. That's a celebrity's job. Look at you, all happy and smiley with your own loser nerd kind. Yeah, I'm happy, while well, you once tried and failed to be one of us, remember? Being a nerd isn't just about appearance, it's about what's inside. By the way, how was the concert? I heard your fanatic behavior got you kicked out. Sounds exciting. Chelsea and the celebs looked fuming as they sashayed off, but I didn't care, as I was finally back where I belonged. I woke up in shock to find my face covered in bandages. <laughs> my face! This can't be happening! Right, Callum? Tell me this is not happening! <laughs> Right after, the doctor entered the room. Miss, unfortunately, the glass from the car window has caused extensive trauma to your skin. As the doctor continued talking, I felt myself zone out and began to panic. My face is everything! Without it, my singing career is over! Ash, it's gonna be okay. I'll help you find a way to return to the stage. I promise. Hi, I'm Ashley, and I had a dream of becoming a famous singer. I used to sing on the streets to collect a few dimes. Then one day, a handsome and polite man approached me. I'm Callum, a talent scout, and I believe with your angelic voice and rare beauty, you have the makings of a star. It was love at first sight, and not only did I gain a manager, but also a hot boyfriend. He arranged for me to perform at cafes, bars, and restaurants. It was nonstop. I enjoyed it, but I have to admit I was also, uh, exhausted. And that's when Callum suggested that I use autotune and lip sync to save my throat. Babe, I know this ain't right, but you're burned out and I can't bear seeing that. You know, it's not forever. I think that way you can focus on dressing up and letting people admire that gorgeous face of yours. Hearing this did make me feel sad, but Callum knew what he was talking about, so I trusted him. While the fire inside me to perform on a professional stage still burned strong. Then one day, he told me some unexpected good news. No more small gigs. The famous company Dream M Entertainment is holding auditions to find their next big star. I've taken care of everything. You just need to be 100% confident in performing. This was it. My time to shine has finally come. But then that evening, while driving home and practicing singing, I had an uncontrollable coughing fit. I lost focus of the road for a split second and didn't see the incoming car until everything went dark. And the next thing I knew, I was waking up at the hospital looking like Frankenstein and certain that my big dreams were now in shatters. After two months in the hospital, most of my scratches healed, but only a deep cut scar remained on my cheek. Just a few days more until the audition, and I couldn't show up looking like this. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Can makeup cover it? Or maybe a mask? There must be something. But the doctor said I can't wear makeup until it's fully healed, as it might cause an infection. <laughs> and if I went on stage in a mask, people would certainly raise questions. Then Callum's eyes suddenly darted to the photo on the shelf. Ash, here's your answer. Get your sister to be your double until your wound heals. Y you mean Bridget? That freak? No way! Yeah, I do have a twin sister, but we aren't close, for sure. My parents divorced when we were seven, and the courts decided I'd live with dad and Bridget with mom. I had a great life with dad, as he bought me any outfit I wanted. But Bridget was a tomboy and didn't care about fashion. The last time I saw her, she was wearing all faded clothes. I guess the whole moody, loner, frown-like-she's-constipated look was her vibe. I tried talking to her at college, but she always snubbed me. And just like that, we ended up being strangers, despite being siblings. And now you say I have to grovel her for help? No! I get that you guys aren't close, but surely you can put your differences aside for this once-in-a-lifetime chance at your dream? <sighs> I suppose Callum has a point. So I agreed. Only it wasn't that simple, as I didn't have Bridget's number and she refused to use social media. You know, to match her cool, unbothered vibe. Ugh. Hang on. I remember her scowling at me behind the counter at the Yo-Yo fast food once. Perhaps she still worked there? 
I immediately disguised myself and headed there. Oh, there she is. I started hovering around her and explained what had happened, then asked her if she'd be my double for the audition. But she didn't bother to care. Get out the way. I can't perform looking like this. Please, this is everything to me. It's none of my business. I have work to do. See, I can't just give up like this. So I ordered food and sat there and waited for her to change her mind. It was closing time already. I was about to leave when I saw Bridget and her boss quarreling with each other. My gosh, this is why it's never good to hire teenagers. I only hired you because you begged for the job. I I'm sorry, sir. I'll... <sighs> Darn it. Starting today, you will work without pay for three months. No, sir, I need money. You didn't even pay me last month. Hey, what are you doing? Go. You can work elsewhere. Don't be here with a scumbag. What? And you? Get lost before I report you to the cops. What you aiming at? Why do you have to work here anyway? Doesn't mom give you a big enough allowance? Don't pretend like you care. How could a spoiled girl like you ever understand? What do you mean by that? Ugh. Anyway, you need money, right? I can help you. Bridget didn't answer, but I saw through her a Miss Frosty persona. If you replace me until I'm recovered, then I'll pay you. A big check worth ten times what you're making here. By the way, only two of us and my manager know about this, so don't worry. Then I gave her my number and told her to message me when she made a decision. She reluctantly took it, saying nothing and just left. But that evening, a message from an unknown number popped up. Okay, I'm in. You better pay me right. I immediately called Callum and told him the good news. Now it's time to turn Bridget into a temporary me. Normally, Callum and I keep our relationship low-key to maintain professionalism. And that's the same now. We're keeping it a secret with Bridget. Callum made it clear to Bridget that all she needed to do was to look pretty and lip sync. But geez, that girl could only moan. This crop is too tight and constricting. Stop scratching like a monkey. I showed her how to stand straight and walk like a diva. And it shocked me when she said she'd never heard of skincare. No wonder her skin was as dry as the Sahara Desert and her pores were as deep and large as black holes. No worries. The witches here will give you a magic transformation. Wow. She looked exactly like me, just without the wound. <sighs> Even Callum was impressed. He instantly offered to help her into the car and drive her to the audition. Mm, I guess it made sense for Callum to keep her on our side. Now is not the time for stupid jealousy, Ashley. I disguised myself as Bridget's assistant and nervously waited backstage. The audition was such a nightmare. Bridget's lip syncing didn't match the pre-recorded audio, and she danced like she had two left feet. Finally, the performance ended, and the first judge to comment was David Knight, a.k.a. the music wizard, master composer, and lord of melodies. Oh, I know this guy. He's sure a demigod in real life. Your singing was dismal, and your dancing was catastrophic. Did you get lost looking for the bathroom and wander on stage by accident? Having a pretty face isn't enough to keep you here. The judge sitting next to David suddenly grabbed the mic. Wait, he's the CEO of Dream M. <clears throat> Uh, you're wrong, David. Beauty is also talent. She's a diamond in the rough and only needs a little polishing to shine. After the show, Callum was overjoyed as he informed Bridget that she'd become a talent at Dream M and would soon become an A-lister. I was so excited, too, that I flung my arms around Bridget, but she coldly pushed me away. Enough for today. Since then, the three of us agreed that Bridget would perform on stage while I would record at the studio. The bad side was about putting up with David, the difficult judge at the audition who was in charge of my recording session. The only thing going for you is your face, so why hide it behind that mask? If you must know, I didn't have time to apply any makeup. Satisfied much? Sorry, what you say? It was too early in the day to deal with such a jerk, so I stayed silent and focused on the session. Hmm... Your singing has improved significantly since the audition. It just still lacks some emotion. Haha, <laughs> thanks. My debut was just days away, but things didn't go so well. Bridget had no sense of style and appeared in the fashion column Worst Dress Lists, shaking like a leaf on stage and jumbling her words when facing impromptu interviews. So I had to set up a crash course for Bridget, but this time I taught her simple, easy-to-remember things instead of big stuff like last time. I showed her how to pair basic outfits, how to deal with the press, and most importantly, I still guaranteed her regular pay. Ash, you, um... You've helped me a lot, and I, anyway, so, uh, thanks. 
Oh my, she was so awkward. But that was sweet. I could gradually feel that we were actually sisters. Bridget, the main effort was still yours. Keep it up. Soon, the company began to promote Bridget, and her reputation skyrocketed. All the while, my relationship with Callum took a nosedive. At previous events, Callum used to pamper me and bring me my favorite foods. But now, he just brought Bridget's favorites. He never left her side, and they were always having cozy chats. So one day, I decided to talk straight to him about this. Callum, I have to admit that I feel kind of uncomfortable, as you're a bit too close to Bridget. Babe, I got you. I have to pretend I'm with Bridget as everyone thinks she's you. I'm doing this for your own good, so stop overthinking. Will you do it for me? I know, but I really feel insecure since I got this scar. It's like I've lost everything. Don't worry, the scar will eventually heal. The most important thing right now is you stay calm and get through this time. Ah, right. I suddenly forgot that I was working for a greater goal. I tried convincing myself that they were just dedicated to their work and that my wound would be healed soon and I could go back to being me. I still go to the hospital every week for follow-up and treatment. It's faded, hasn't it? I needed to escape, so I went to the studio to sing my heart out. I was certain no one would be there at this time of night, but turned out I was wrong. Surprisingly, on seeing me, that dude didn't shoo me away. Instead, he was actually pleasant. A night owl too, huh? Start singing then. I'll give you my valuable opinions. I was shocked by this approachability, but I rolled with it. David was many things, but there was no denying he was extraordinarily talented that made huge hits. I sing, and he gave me some useful tips and pointers. I believed you'd be too haughty to listen to my guidance, but it turns out I was mistaken. Well, I found you annoying at first, but I appreciate your help and I value your feedback. It seems there's actually a nice guy behind the ogre front. S sorry, what you say? I won't say it twice. Then I started humming a few lines from a song I'd written, but didn't realize I was singing it out loud until it was too late. That song is good. Whose is it? Uh, actually, I wrote it. No need to be mocking. No, I'm not at all. I didn't know you had a talent for songwriting. Come here. Let me hear the whole song. So we sat down together, and surprisingly, our vibe matched each other perfectly. Actually, you're the first person to take my ability seriously. Sorry? Hey, stop pretending! Actually, I'm not pre- Gradually, Bridget seemed to figure out how to act like me, and her popularity grew. She was no longer sluggish and paid more attention to her appearance. Even Callum mentioned how he could only distinguish us by my wound. From then on, Callum said Bridget could do it herself, so they went to the shows without me. This feeling is making me squirm. On the one hand, I want Bridget to do well to help me out. On the other hand, I'm also feeling a bit resentful that I was replaced so easily. I also miss the way Callum used to care about me. But I remember what he said the other day, and I know I shouldn't be acting like a child. So I tried to distract myself by doing what I love the most, singing. Everybody was packed with Bridget's show, so this world is mine. Woohoo! I was in the studio practicing my new song when suddenly David barged in. Can you explain to me why you're here whilst also performing on TV live? W why are you here? Does it even matter now? Who really are you? I begged him to keep quiet. Then I frantically took my mask off and told him everything. I mean, everything. As I was too shocked to make any excuses. This is insane. I know it isn't right, but, but I, I promised once my wound healed, everything would go back to normal. Singing is everything to me. David remained silent for a while, then blurted out, All right, if what you said is true, I will keep your secret. And one more thing, if you really like singing and songwriting, I can continue to help you. What do you say? Y yes, yes, totally, yes. And don't you dare lie to me. I'm not sure what I'm going to do. Yeah, swear to God. Finally, it was the follow-up day. As the doctor finished the examination, I saw him frown. I'm sorry to inform you that the scar cuts too deep. It may fade over time, but I'm afraid it won't go completely. At least in two years. I broke down. This couldn't be happening. <laughs> Not knowing what else to do, I decided to go and find Callum. But when I arrived at his house, I saw that he wasn't alone. Bridget and Callum were sitting together and slowly... Leaning for a kiss.